Thank you. It's great to have almost a full house again. Uh, please turn your microphones on when you wish to speak and off when you are finished so that we may limit the microphones that are on at any one given time. Uh, I'll call on those with questions or comments for those attending in person. For those who are remotely joining us, keep your audio on mute as much as possible to minimize background noise because we do record these meetings. When you have a question or comment, please raise your virtual hand. You're all good at that after the last couple of years. Uh, and the board secretary, Mr. LaMarche, will call on board members um, who have raised their hands um, one at a time. Uh, when he calls on you, um, do remember, if you could, to lower your hand virtually uh, and unmute yourself before speaking. Uh, with that said, I will now officially call this uh, meeting of the Board of Directors of the Regional Transportation Authority to uh, order. And let's begin, as we always do, with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, if we may. Pledge of Allegiance to the Lord, the United States of America. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, can you take the roll, please? Sure. Uh, Director Indelcio? Here. Director Canty? Here. Director Carey? Here. Director Colson? Here. Director Fuentes? Here. Director Gavin? Here. Uh, Director Gorman? Here. Director Groven? Here. Director Holt? Here. Director Cotel? Here. Director Lewis? Director Melvin? Here. Director Pang? Here. Director Ross? Here. Director Sager? Here. Chairman Dillard? Present. 15 present, one absent, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We have more than a quorum. Um, before we get started, I want to acknowledge and congratulate uh, a couple of our members on the recent electoral victories. Uh, Director Canny, um, you'll be a phenomenal member of the Illinois General Assembly, and uh, we wish you uh, well down there. You'll join uh, Senator DeWitt, uh, another alum of this board. Uh, but congratulations, uh, and uh, we're very proud of you. And another uh, good political veteran, uh, Dr. Sager, congratulations on uh, your win out in McHenry County. And uh, we, uh, we wish, uh, you know, and hopefully we'll continue to see you here. Uh, but congratulations, uh, doctor. With that, uh, and, uh, and our chest pumped out, which is great, uh, it's always good to see our, our members uh, you know, move on to uh, bigger and better things, I guess. Uh, but item three is the approval of the minutes from the board meeting held on October 17th of 2022. Any comments or corrections? Uh, if not, um, how about a motion and a second to approve? Uh, Director Melvin uh, moves we approve, seconded by Director Gorman. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Secretary, take a roll call on that, will you please? Sure. Director Indelcio. Aye. Director Canty. Aye. Director Carey. Aye. Director Colson. Aye. Director Fuentes. Aye. Director Gavin. Aye. Director Gorman. Aye. Director Groven. Aye. Director Holt. Aye. Director Cotel. Aye. Director Lewis. Director Melvin. Yes. Director Pang. Yes. Director Ross. Uh, Director Sager. Yes. Chairman Diller. Yes. 15 eyes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. It's good to hear Director Pang's voice. Good morning, Sarah. Uh, item four is the public comments segment of the meeting. Uh, and uh, the, we, we did approve the uh, the minutes in item three. Um, are there any public comments for uh, item four? Anybody in the audience? Yes, sir. Come on up. If you would, tell us your name. Thank you. My name is Michael Edward Lafargue. I'm a former RTA employee, and I'm here for a couple of reasons. 
One, I'd like to commend CTA President Dorvell Carter for his historic investments in the CTA infrastructure and everything that he is doing to move forward the red line extension. It's very important to our community that that occurs. Also, I'm here to commend Metra for their work at the 95th Street Terminal near Chicago State University. I'm a little bit out of breath. I was a little bit late coming here. <laughs> Um, transportation in our communities, all of them throughout the six county region is very important. Yeah. It's a, uh, we call it social parade, so optimality. It's where the private sector fails, the public sector moves forward and does the job. So thank you for your work and anything that you can do to help President Carter move forward the transitive for the red line extension, that is our request. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we were involved in the original TIF, and my guess is we will uh, will be involved in this one as well. Although it's the city council that makes that decision. And thanks for the nice words on on President Carter as well as uh, Metro. Um, so thank you and welcome back. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other public comments, Jeremy? Anybody? Um, Come in online. Uh, no, we received no other comments, Mr. Okay. Chairman. <clears throat> Great. Um, we will then move on to item five, which is the executive director's report. Um, Leanne Redden. Hi, I'm hiding over here today. Hiding on the left side. <clears throat> Just to keep everyone on their toes. So, good morning, everybody, uh, members of the board, service boards, staff, and those from the public who have joined us this morning. Um, we're anticipating a longer meeting today, so I'm going to be very brief. Uh, with my comments, but I first uh, hope just want to highlight that you've had a chance to look at our relaunched website. You can see some of the new branding on some of these slides here as well. Uh, the new website that launched uh, earlier this week prioritizes accessibility and user experience. You got a, a preview of that last month at our meeting, but it also follows earlier launches of uh, work we've done uh, related around the um, online fair program. Uh, the application portal, and really a broader focus on continuing improvement on how people can interact with our services across the region. Uh, since we last met, both the chairman and I have had several opportunities to visit with partners and communities around the region. Uh, the chairman attended a station groundbreaking in Clarendon Hills, and we, and we both participated in a uh, joint speaking event with the American, well, I was going to say ACEC, but I'll say American Council of Engineering Companies of Illinois. Um, tomorrow, I will also have the pleasure of joining Director Carey as we speak to the Lake County Transportation Alliance for their annual meeting. Um, and on December 7th, I invite all of you to uh, consider joining us for two events. The first is an afternoon panel uh, discussing the future of transit at City Club. And then that evening, that same evening, we will have our public hearing. Uh, you'll be able to find more information about both of those uh, on our regional transit update newsletter that goes out tomorrow. And we expect that these events are just the first of many more opportunities that we will continue to educate uh, and engage partners across the region on our funding challenges we're facing and our plans to address some of those challenges. So next slide, please. So before I dive into, we get deep into the budget presentations, I just want to briefly note our place in our budget and strategic plan timeline. Today, you're going to hear presentations from the three service boards, and that will also open up our public comment period uh, on the budget, which will close on December 15, which is the time when you are at our next board meeting, when you'll be asked to approve and consider the, the overall budget. As we um, meet today, the draft strategic plan is with the our, our partners at the service boards and CMAP uh, looking for their comments uh, on that draft document. On Monday, December 5, we will also release uh, that plan for public comment. And I invite everyone here to join our virtual public hearing on December 7th. Uh, it'll serve as an opportunity to engage the public on both the budget as well as the strategic plan. Uh, and our public comment period for that plan will close in early January. And as we've talked about with you before, the plan will be considered for adoption at our February board meeting. 
Our December 7 virtual public hearing will also serve as our final movers workshop, which is really the third and sort of final convening um, of a broad group of key stakeholders across our region who have been very engaged with us throughout the plan development. And uh, that meeting will also include a presentation on both the budget and the strategic plan. Uh, as well as an opportunity for visitors to self-select into some breakout rooms if they want to do a deeper dive and have uh, more informal conversations with staff and others um, about some of the work that we are doing. Simultaneous to those breakout sessions, we'll have the more typical public hearing format set up. Uh, we'll be listening and open for public comments um, and with staff and the chairman will be attending that. Our goal is to really do two things, adhere to the requirements of public hearings and providing everybody that opportunity in a, in a flexible environment, but also providing, I think, a little more accessible and hopefully more engaging opportunities for people to talk with us in a less formal way about some of the work and the issues that we're facing. Uh, so we're hopefully that is well, hopefully that will be well attended. And my, <clears throat> excuse me, final slide is um, today, as I've mentioned, will largely be the service board budget presentations, uh, as well as the RTA's 2023 proposed budget. We'll then have present, a presentation on the quarterly performance report uh, the third, for the third quarter. We'll ask for your vote on the uh, third quarter certification of the financial results. There's two contracts for your consideration and a resolution setting our all important dates for 2023. Uh, and then uh, Chairman's Expenses Report. And so that actually concludes my report. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. Great, thank you. Any questions of Leanne? If not, let's move right into item six, which are the presentations and discussions of the 2023 uh, agency budgets or service boards bu budgets with the CTA, PACE, Metra, and our own uh, here at the RTA. and. Uh, for the CTA, um, I want to thank uh, President Carter. Uh, Jeremy Fine, the CFO, is here, and Michelle Curran, the Deputy CFO uh, and Comptroller, will, uh, will be presenting. And uh, I turn it over to the CTA and however they want to present. Good morning, and thanks for coming over. Thank you for having me. Um, it's good to see everyone in person after years of virtual Zoom meetings. So, uh, Chairman Dillard and ladies and gentlemen of the board, good morning. Joining me today is Jeremy Fine, CTA's Chief Financial Officer, Michelle Coran, CTA's Deputy Chief Financial Officer and Comptroller, Mike Connolly, CTA's Chief Planning Officer, and Tom McComb, CTA's Chief Administrative Officer. It is my pleasure to address you and to discuss CTA's proposed $1.8 billion operating budget for fiscal year 2023. I'm proud to say that the spending plan holds the line on all fares while continuing to provide the highest level of service possible. The budget also reflects the steady increase in ridership the CTA has seen all year. We are currently providing more than 900,000 rides each weekday, which is almost 60% of our pre-pandemic level. It is one of the largest ridership recoveries in the U.S. of a, any U.S. transit agency and a continuing reflection of how public transit has remained an essential service for the last two and a half years of the pandemic. Since March of 2020, we have strived to provide as much service as possible for those who use transit. And while overall we put forth a strong effort, there is no question that we have faced a number of challenges. None of them are unique to us. Indeed, every U.S. transit system is facing them. The CTA has been acutely focused on addressing them. By far, the biggest challenge has been workforce shortages. Like nearly every business, we've seen the impacts of the Great Resignation, along with marketplace competition for workers, especially for bus and train operators. When we don't have enough people to drive our buses and trains, we can't provide the level of service we want to. That can lead to longer than normal delays and inconsistent service at some times of the day. It has also led to some of the issues that I'm sure you've heard about regarding our bus and train trackers, which use a combination of both schedule and real-time information. So when our schedules are off, because we don't have enough workers to provide certain trips, the trackers will be off. That is what creates what are commonly referred to as ghost buses 
and ghost trains. I want you to know that addressing these issues is my top priority. That's why in August, I announced a meeting the moment plan, which hopefully all of you have heard about. And if, if you haven't, I can make sure that all of you get a copy of it. Um, the meeting the moment plan is a multifaceted plan to strengthen the rider experience, more consistent and reliable service, safe rides, clean facilities, modern amenities, dynamic customer engagement tools, and a strong CTA workforce. It is the first such plan of its kind among major U.S. transit agencies. In the two months since the plan has been in place, we have made some significant strides. We've introduced new rail schedules that reflect our current workforce availability. The new schedules aim to provide more consistent and reliable service and reduce the large wait times customers sometimes experience. They will also help the issue of ghost trains. We have undertaken unprecedented efforts to recruit and hire new employees. CTA has hosted or participated in more than a dozen in-person and virtual job fairs, some in conjunction with our unions, with another plan just tomorrow at Olive Harvey College. And speaking of Olive Harvey College, we've also recently developed a great program with them to offer a free preparatory course to assist candidates in obtaining their commercial learner's permit, which is needed to obtain a commercial driver's license required to be a CTA bus operator. We're also working on the other pillars of meeting the moment, including a continued focus on providing a safe and comfortable environment for our customers. As you know, we have a decades long partnership with the Chicago Police Department, which provides law enforcement for CTA. This year, CPD has added more resources to CTA. But in addition to that, CTA has also increased the security budget from $15 million in 2019 to $41 million in 2023. That includes supplementing CPD officers with private contracted security guards, as well as new K-9 teams. And just yesterday, our board approved an agreement to extend our partnership with the Chicago Department of Family and Support Services to provide additional outreach and support for riders who are unsheltered, as well as those grappling with mental health and substance abuse, which is an ongoing problem on our system. As we're working to address these current challenges, we are also keeping our eye on the future. We are certainly addressing our growing $13 billion in state of good repair needs with our five-year $3.5 billion capital improvement plan that has been made possible by a mix of federal and local funding including the state of Illinois' Rebuild Illinois Capital Pro. Among the many capital projects that we'll tackle in 2023 are our all station accessibility program to make CTA's rail system 100% vertically accessible, the Blue Line Forest Park branch track and power improvements, the first phase of a comprehensive rebuild of that branch of my system, the Refresh and Renew program, which is an expanded and accelerated rail station improvement program that we're implementing throughout the system, a Better Street for Buses, a comprehensive citywide plan for bus priority streets, an expansion of our electric bus fleet, part of CTA's commitment to complete the electrification of the entire bus fleet by the year 2040. So far, we have invested $415 million in e-buses, including an additional $257 million in our 2023-2027 capital improvement plan. In addition, earlier this year, we released Charging Forward, our master plan for full electrification, as you know, electrifying our fleet of more than 1,800 buses takes more than just purchasing new vehicles. It requires an extensive charging infrastructure and significant electrical power upgrades across the service area. Charging infrastructure must go hand in hand with the purchase of electric buses. Otherwise, I will be purchasing buses that I cannot use. Chargers will be required at all garages and at various key locations along select bus routes to support our service, which operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We also continue to work on what will be the largest project in CTA's history and one that is personally very important to me, the Red Line Extension, which will extend the CTA's busiest rail line to the southern city limits, providing transit access and connectivity, finally, from CTA's perspective on the far south side. We have also continued to focus on more regional cooperation and coordination among the service boards. And earlier this year, we replaced the Metro link up with a new regional connect pass, which expanded the hours of use outside of the rush hours and lowered the price from $30 down from 55. 
We're also making changes to the pay CTA products to streamline our offerings and remove the premium pricing for passes used on CTA and pays. This includes the low price 30 day CTA and pays unlimited ride pass available for $75 in 2023. CTA will also eliminate the $25 seven day CTA and pays pass and instead offer only the existing $20 seven day CTA pass for use on pace as well. We will also expand the existing one and three day passes to include pace rides. And I want to thank my colleagues at pace for their support in helping us coordinate um, uh, this new fair approach strategy that we think will be beneficial not only to CTA, but also to our pace customers. We recognize and look forward to continuing to close to work closely with the RTA and the service board to continue to make the case for additional operating and capital funding to ensure transit needs of Chicago metropolitan area are met and expanded upon into the future. Like our fellow service boards, Metro and Pace, our ridership losses have taken a significant toll on our operating budget's bottom line. For 2023, CTA is facing a $390 million deficit in our operating budget. Fortunately, we've been able to offset the unprecedented losses of fare revenue, thanks in large part to the federal relief funds designated for public transit nationwide. That federal funding, which totals more than $2 billion for CTA, has been a lifeline, enabling us to continue providing the services the region has relied on. This federal funding will help carry us through fiscal year 2025, but there's no question that additional funding will be needed in the future to continue to deliver the level of service our customers are demanding. It would take draconian reductions in service to offset the type of projected shortfalls that we are facing. And that's one of the reasons why we are very supportive of the work that RTA is doing on a strategic plan. And obviously are looking forward to working with CMAP on their broader um, um, strategy around how we really make sure that we bring the level of financial stability that is very important, not only the CTA, but to my sister agencies and to the city and the region as a whole. Despite these unprecedented challenges posed by the pandemic, we continue to put our customers first and we work hard to provide the best service for those who need us the most in Chicago and in the surrounding suburbs. And if I can take a moment to just say, um, I'm sure all of you have been very much aware of the criticism that CTA has been receiving of late and of me in particular. Uh, I think it's important to point out, and I want to just acknowledge that in spite of that criticism, I have thousands of people who are working every day on the front lines to put out service 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They don't get accolades. They don't get, you know, pats on the back. In many cases, they get abused and assaulted and, and challenged over the service challenges that we're, that we're dealing with. But I am very proud and, and very, very happy to have the type of dedicated workforce that supports the city every day. And we will continue to do, and I will continue to do everything that I can to support them. So I appreciate your attention uh, for listening to me talk about this past year and, and the year to come. And with that, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Jerry and Michelle to, to very briefly walk you through a presentation, a little bit more detailed presentation of our budget. Jeremy. Thank you, Dorval. I'm Jeremy Fine uh, for the CTA. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, the RTA staff, including uh, uh, B. Raina Hickey, but uh, she leaves the uh, RTA staff and, and, and finance team in great hands. Uh, and we appreciate the collaborative spirit of the budget uh, with not only RTA staff, but Metro and Pace as well. Uh, I'll dive into a little bit more detail of what Dorval had highlighted in his remarks. Uh, you know, slide three here uh, really is uh, an overview of the 2022 forecast. Uh, and it is a $258 million favorable to budget uh, forecast, which is driven by the stronger uh, public funding revenues and lower expenses, which have allowed us to extend the life of the federal relief funding uh, that we've received. The 2022 forecast requires $258 million less of federal relief funding than originally budgeted, uh, which is, again, due to the higher system-generated revenues of about $6.2 million dollars, um, driven by higher fare box collections, as well as additional uh, advertising revenues, both on vehicles and platform ads. Uh, the public funding is forecast to be about $104 million higher than budgeted, uh, as sales taxes continue to outperform expectations, uh, in part due to the expansion of the base in 2021 uh, to include online sales and cannabis. Uh, PTF uh, also being fully restored in 2021 has also helped uh, and the re uh, revenues remain robust. 
expenses are about $150 million less than budgeted uh, due to positive variances that we see in labor, fuel, and power, and contracts. Uh, based on these trends, we uh, see the 2022 forecast uh, is about uh, a, a draw of about $200 million of federal relief funding. Uh, so again, substantially below what we had originally expected uh, at the beginning of the year. Uh, the 2023 operating budget is fiscally prudent. Uh, the overall operating revenues excluding federal relief funds are expected to increase about 11.3% in 2023. In particular, system generated revenues uh, are expected uh, or are budgeted to be 6.7% uh, higher than the 2022 budget. Uh, fare box revenues are expected to be about 54% of 2019 levels. Uh, public funding marks per the RTA are budgeted to be 121.6 uh, million or 13.2% higher than prior year budget. Uh, and again, this is driven by the uh, addition of online sales tax and cannabis, uh, the continuation of the full PTF receipts, uh, no additional state cuts uh, are expected. Uh, and again, just to highlight, and we'll talk more about this in a moment, but the, uh, the, the recovery ratio relief through 2023 is helpful here as we continue to exit uh, the effects of the pandemic. Expenses are expected to increase about $81 million or 4.6%. Uh, the expense growth rate compared to 2022 budget is less than the revenue growth rate uh, that we see of about 11.3%, uh, which is allowing us to reduce the reliance on federal relief funding uh, compared to the expectations at this time last year. And then uh, the $1.2 billion of federal relief funds carried over into 2023 uh, from the $2.2 billion uh, are expected to be able to carry us through 2025 and into the very early part of 2026. On the next slide, we talk about additional funding uh, is critical uh, to continue to close future budget gaps beyond 2025. Again, we expect to use the remaining uh, 1.2 billion uh, to balance the budgets from 2023 through 2025. Uh, total expenses uh, are expected to increase uh, by 4.2% in 2024 and 3.7 in 2025. Uh, and then system generated uh, revenues are expected to grow at higher rates of 6.4% uh, both in 2024 and 2025. Uh, public funding marks are expected to increase 2.8% uh, in 2024 and 3.9% in 2025. On the next slide, uh, we highlight uh, our ridership estimates. Uh, fiscal year 2023 ridership increases 9.3% uh, from 2022. Uh, the 2022 ridership is rebounding and forecasted to finish the year 23% higher than where we were in 2021. Uh, the 2022 uh, ridership uh, is projected to finish the year at 53% of 2020 or 2019 ridership. Uh, and bus ridership is expected to uh, be at 57% and rail ridership at 47% of 2019 levels. Uh, the 2023 ridership is expected to grow again, 9.3% from 2022 or about 58% of 2019 levels. Uh, 2024 and 2025 ridership is expected to be 62% 62 and 67% of 2019 levels respectively. Uh, the rate of rebound in the industry is slower uh, than we initially anticipated due to the continued effects of COVID-19, uh, work from home policies and changing behavior. But again, the meeting the moment plan that Dorville had highlighted really provides the guideposts for us to continue to drive ridership back to the system. Uh, that plan is outlined on the next slide and there's five key pillars to improve the customer experience and enhance our system and driving ridership back to the system. Pillar one, deliver reliable and consistent service. Uh, we're doing this by increasing hiring to address manpower issues uh, uh, needed to operate the scheduled service, launching service optimization to match available workforce and hiring and training, improving bus and rail infrastructure and fleet. Pillar two focuses on enhancing safety and security for our riders uh, by expanding police officer patrols, deploying special units uh, and increasing private security guards. Uh, we're also assisting people experiencing homelessness and mental health issues and drug abuse on the system. Pillar three focuses on improving customer experience at facilities. Uh, we look to improve already extensive cleaning protocols 
uh, and look to complete the refresh and renew program, uh, increasing janitorial staffing. And pillar four focuses on upgrading digital tools to improve rider communication, which enhances bus and rail tracker feeds and features uh, in the Ventra app. Uh, we're also uh, launching a pilot, uh, you know, with uh, uh, a chat with CTA uh, known as a chat bot feature. Uh, and we're also engaging in ongoing customer feedback initiatives, uh, which you've probably seen out on the system through the Ask CTA events that we're hosting. Pillar five focuses on investing in our employees by ex uh, exploring and advancing competitive hiring and retention strategies with union leadership, uh, launching bigger uh, refresh and renew program to improve facilities, expansion of uh, employee recognition programs, providing CSAs with video screens to better monitor station activities, installing new and sturdier driver shields on buses, uh, and improve uh, the safe line anonymous reporting system for employees. Again, uh, these underscore the importance uh, of what we're trying to do to attract riders back to the system. And these points and, and, the, real, and the pillars that we've outlined here are really the key points that have been raised to us as part of our uh, public hearing process uh, for the 23 budget. So again, these are addressing the main uh, points that have been raised in those hearings. Uh, and we look forward to continuing to execute these to drive ridership back to the system. I'll now turn it over to Michelle Curran uh, to walk through the CIP program. Thank you, Jeremy. Good morning, I'm Michelle Curran, Deputy CFO and Comptroller for CTA. The 2023 to 2027 CIP is a $3.4 billion program that funds major projects including the Red Line Extension, the All Stations Accessibility Program, conversion to an electric bus fleet, and bus and rail fleet modernization. The funding sources for the CIP include federal funds, state PAYGO funds for motor fuel tax revenues, and CTA bonds. We will also continue to seek additional FTA discretionary grant funding awards as they become available, particularly to accelerate the ASAP and bus electrification programs, as well as requesting funds, new start funding for the Red Line Extension Project. The next several slides include some of the details around specific projects in the CIP. Next slide, please. First is the Red Line Extension to the South, which is estimated to cost $3.6 billion. The Red Line Extension would extend the rail line 5.6 miles from the 95th Street Terminal to 130th Street, including four new stations, park and ride facilities, and a storage yard and maintenance facility. We're currently in the project development phase and expect to enter into project engineering later this year. We also expect to request City Council approval in December for a new TIF district to provide the local match funding source for the project. Next slide, please. The All Stations Accessibility, or ASAP, program is a comprehensive 20-year program to make all stations vertically accessible. 103 of CTA's 145 stations, or 73%, are already accessible. Phase one of the plan, which is fully funded, includes nine more stations to be made fully accessible, including the four Red Line stations as part of RPM, the Austin Green Line Station, California, Montrose, and Racine stations on the Blue Line, and the State and Lake Elevated Station. The 2023 to 2027 CIP includes funding for phase two of the program, including design for six stations, the Irving Park, Belmont, Division, and Chicago stations on the Blue Line, and Oak Park and Ridgeland on the Green Line. It also completes construction funding for Irving Park and Belmont and provides initial funding for Oak Park and Ridgeland. With the completion of these additional stations, the rail system will be 81% accessible. The program also includes upgrades or replacements of existing elevators, and as I mentioned earlier, we'll continue to seek additional FTA discretionary grants for the program. Next slide, please. The CIP funding, the CIP includes funding of 257 million for the conversion to electric buses. This will complete the funding need to modernize the Chicago Avenue garage for e-buses and begin funding for upgrades to the 103rd Street garage or to begin funding construction for a new garage. It also funds upgrade, it also funds 142.5 million towards the next e-bus purchase and including previously granted funds, we will have invested over 415 million to the conversion of, uh, to bus electrification. Next slide, please. The CIP also invests in the bus and rail fleet modernization. Bus improvements include purchasing the remaining new standard buses, 
providing funding for new e-buses to replace the 4,000 series buses and perform overhauls on existing buses. On the rail side, we funded the purchase of the new 7,000 series rail cars and overhaul work for the existing 5,3200 and 2,600 series rail cars. We also continue to invest in capital maintenance and equipment to target needs between overhaul cycles for both bus and rail cars. Next slide, please. And finally, while already fully funded and not included in the 2023 to 2027 CIP, the Red Purple Modernization Project is the largest project undertaken by CTA to date and phase one is well underway. RPM will, will improve capacity, travel time, ride quality and safety on one of CTA's highest ridership corridors. Phase one is $2.1 billion and includes three major components, the Red Purple Bypass Bridge, Lawrence, Argyle, Berwyn, and Bryn Mawr stations, and a new signal system between Belmont and Howard stations. Phase one is expected to be completed in 2025 and future phases of RPM are in the planning stage. This concludes the presentation and we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you very much. Questions or comments from the board? Dr. Sager. Well, first, I want to thank you all for being here with us uh, today. And uh, Mr. Carter, I want to extend uh, significant commendations to you all, to your staff, and to your board for what I consider to be exceptional work uh, during some very challenging years. So I, I, I want to uh, say how much we appreciate your continued professionalism, dedication, and accomplishment. Uh, it's been difficult, and certainly there's been a strong vocal discord, which has been presented out there. Um, but the reality is that uh, there's a huge silent majority that uh, truly appreciates the service and recognizes the challenges that you all and others in transit have had to uh, deal with as we have gone through these uh, cha changing times. The question I have is that I, I actually uh, represent McHenry County on this RTE board. And the McHenry County has a very, very strong aggregate uh, voice for environmental protection. And so you mentioned uh, in the multiple presentations here today that uh, there is an emphasis upon e-buses. And one of the things that we get lots of questions about is how we are progressing towards uh, that transition. One of the things that uh, I have understood in the past is that made char um, challenge with that is the fact that you have extended routes the charging only lasts for so long and so uh, you have to do some things to kind of uh, recharge in mid routes um, and so i'd like you to explain that to me just a little bit better so that i have an understanding of how to explain it to our residents sure um as you know cta's bus system operates 24 hours a day seven days a week so when our buses leave the garage in many cases they don't come back to that garage until 13, 14, you know, 16 hours later. Um, uh, and that's when they would come to bed to get refueled, cleaned, and then prepared to go back out the, the next day. Um, given that reality, uh, there is no technology that exists today that would allow me to charge that bus at the beginning of the day or overnight and expect it to run throughout the entire day without some level of recharging uh, that has to occur with it. Uh, the way that we have approached dealing with that is is basically starting to identify key locations on our routes where we can put charging stations. Uh, they're around bus turnarounds and other places where the bus will sit for a limited period of time. And during that time, they can connect up to a rapid charger charging system that will give them not a full recharge, but will basically sort of top them off and, and give them enough uh, to keep operating uh, as the day goes forward. The complexities around that are tied directly to one, um, I have a number of garages throughout the system that serve various parts of, of the city as a whole. Uh, and you're coordinating both where you can put the charging systems and where your buses run to make the most efficient use of the, techn of the, the technology and the charging system that we're talking about. I can tell you that it's a very complicated process to go through and if you get it wrong, you run the risk of having buses that either run out of power mid, you know, in the middle of their service or buses that you can't put on the street because you don't have a way to charge them. That's what drives the timing for when we're buying our electric buses. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around the fact that we're still buying diesel buses when, when we, um, 
uh, made our commitment to buy electric buses. The reason we're doing that is because a number of reasons. One, CTA, is, as you know, is one of the biggest transit systems in the country. When we place bus orders, they're usually in the multiple hundreds at a time. We, we buy buses for 400, 500 buses at a time. We don't buy five or six buses like many systems do uh, around the country. As you can imagine, there's very limited capacity to fulfill those kind of orders of that magnitude. Um, so what we have done is we've developed a plan that basically will transition our bus fleet over time while obviously dealing with the fact that I have buses that are, you know, 10, 12, 13 years old that I cannot keep running um, uh, until I can get to the point to replace them. So we're replacing them with newer buses. Now, we'll point out that the newer buses are much cleaner than the old buses that they're replacing. Uh, and I'll make a broader point, which seems to get lost in the conversation about electrification, which is public transit as a whole is a climate friendly activity. Uh, I've read some, I read some data in the last um, couple of days about the percentage of, of, of um, particulate um, uh, uh, material that transit buses emanate in the city of Chicago if you compare it to all the other vehicles that operate in the city. Transit buses basically put out 1.5% of all the, the carbon emissions in the city of Chicago. Private vehicles put out well over 50 something percent. So if you really wanna impact climate change and deal with the effects of that, then what you should be arguing for are the policies, and when I say you, I don't necessarily mean this board, but what we should be arguing for are policies that drive more people to public transit, provide more efficient mobility for the public as a whole, and reduce the, the climate impact of single occupancy vehicles. The criticisms that have been raised on CTA is like going after the net at, on the, pen, you know, and the tip of the pen uh, when it comes to climate change when you should be going after the elephant in the room, which is really, how do you get people out of their cars? Well, when you get people out of your cars, you have good public transit. And I know that's what we're all committed to doing. And that's certainly what we're working closely with RTA and CMAP to make sure that we can continue to do that. But in the meantime, we're gonna to continue to aggressively move forward to transition our fleet over time in a way that's rational and will ultimately support the investments that you approve for the rolling stock that we purchase on an annual basis. Just a follow up, please. Um, I don't want to put you all on spot today, but I do have a question that perhaps you might be able to provide an answer for as we look to the future. Um, as you have done your budget effort and work, um, what do you believe to be the increase in costs to provide for these recharging midpoint um, stations? And what is the cost of redundancy in terms of additional uh, vehicles that you have to purchase to just to make the system work with the e vehicles? Well, I, to the second question, I don't think there's a redundancy cost. We're not buying extra vehicles to do this. That's why we have the plan that takes the amount of time that it does. As we replace our diesel buses with electric buses, we're doing it on a on a one to one basis with the understanding that we're, you know, that we're obviously churning over. Now, an electric bus does cost more than a diesel bus, um, but there's also studies and analysis that show that the overall life cycle cost of an electric bus can be lower than a diesel bus because of the technology that's being used. Um, I don't have the detail answer to your question, um, uh, but we can certainly get you that information uh, and share, it, share sort of what those, those cost differentials are. Uh, between where we are and what we're doing. Yeah, I would appreciate that very, very much. Um, and when I said redundancy, I, I'm indicating that um, I wonder if you all have buses kind of in those midpoint recharging stations that are kind of uh, waiting so that they can take off immediately. That's what I'm looking at. No, the, the, the reason that we're targeting these buses at bus turnarounds is that those are locations where the buses sit normally as part of our schedule. It's an opportunity for the operator to to take a personal um, uh, and relieve themselves or other things. And so the schedules already exist to accommodate that sitting. 
And what we're doing is using that time to actually do charging of the buses. Perfect. I appreciate that so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Director Indolcio. Good morning, Mr. Carter. Good morning, Jeremy. And thank you so much for your amazing leadership. It's not easy, especially during the pandemic. Out of the 1.8 uh, billion operating budget, how much of those dollars are allocated for safety and security? I know Jerry, you talked about CPD and private security guards, but are you looking to invest in technology such as infrared cameras, heat sensors? to combat some of the security concerns? Um, yeah, the short answer is yes. It, it is not just a human resources strategy that we're applying. As you know, CTA has over 34,000 cameras on our system. And one of the things that I've tasked my team to look at uh, is how do we use that technology or leverage that technology in a more proactive way um, using, you know, new software and other, you know, other, you know, um, um, technological upgrades that allow our cameras, for lack of a better word, to be smart, um, to allow us to know when there are things happening that are out of the norm, like extended period of times where crowds may be st sitting or standing somewhere, uh, or even uh, technology that we can put on our, our, our fare boxes that can let us know if someone is jumping the turnstile instead of paying their fare. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the stuff that's going on in, in the technological world right now is pretty amazing. Uh, and and certainly I, I have an innovation team who is, is tasked specifically with examining that technology and looking at ways that we can implement it for all sorts of things, including right-of-way intrusion and all the other things that we talk about um, that impact my service and that obviously have a negative impact on the customer experience. So you'll be hearing more about that as we identify those technologies to make the investments in it. I don't I don't have the exact number Jeremy made for what our security budget is overall. Um, but as you heard in, in my remarks, we have more than tripled the amount of money that we're spending on security today from where we were in the pre pandemic levels, which is certainly a, a, a you know measure of our of our intentions to continue to do everything that we can to make our systems as safe as possible. Um, obviously, crime on CTA is not does not get created by CTA. Uh, it is a reflection of the challenges that we have throughout the city and the region. Uh, and as as those issues get better, so does the issue on CTA get better. So it's a complicated conversation, and I can tell you that I spent about three and a half hours discussing it with city council last week. Um, but it's one that we're definitely committed to. Uh, and we'll put any resources, technological or otherwise, to that effort to make sure that we're giving not only CTA, but the police department themselves the tools that they need to properly police our system. Well, thank you so much. It's so good to hear. And one final question, uh, speaking to your customer experience, um, what task force, uh, in addition to everything that you're doing to enhance the customer experience, to make sure those buses are clean, friendly, and well, one of the things that we've done is we, we are increasing significantly the number of, of cleaning resources in our budget. Um, Jeremy didn't didn't mention this as he was going through the presentation, but the increases that are that are in my budget are very much targeted to the meeting the moment plan. And so with very limited exception, most of the money that I'm spending, particularly on the resource side, of the house are intended to support the implementation of the plan itself. We're very focused on how we operationalize what I've developed and making sure that we have the resources to do that. I will tell you that one of the benefits of having the federal relief funds is that it gives me the ability to fund things like what we're talking about that I would not probably be in a position to do otherwise. Um, but yeah, we're being very strategic about that uh, and figuring out what the best way is to basically implement and improve the customer experience on a number of fronts as we continue to address the other challenges that we're facing. Thank you, sir. Great presentation. Thank you. Director Andalcio, it's interesting. The gentleman who is uh, overseeing much of the renovation and rebirth of LaSalle Street, including the Thompson Center, um, even suggested perfume uh, in, in one of his uh, one of his, his op-ed pieces. So uh, cleaning, cleaning comes first, perfume second. But uh, a number of innovative things that are out there, including perfume or fragrance. Any other questions? Director Colson? 
Um, yeah, as a matter of perspective, I've been on this board a long time. And this is the first period of time where I've observed that the service boards report numbers that are a huge deficit, but are still favorable to budget. And that tells me that the world has really been stood on its ear during COVID, and that's something we've never faced before. So I think you're doing all you can do to respond to that. Um, uh, another question on, um, as I do the math on your capital budget, your debt service is about 29% of your capital budget. Is that about right? Yes. And in light of PAYGO, I mean, it might even be more if, if you if you haven't deferred some capital um, spending on some of the principal payments, rather. My question for long term is, do you see this number trending up or down in the future in light of the new PAYGO source of funds? Yeah, so I, I, I just want to kind of back up just a little bit, just a little bit more color, just on the overall debt portfolio that CTA has, because I know that there's been questions uh, about this in the past as well, and I think it's just helpful to kind of break it down. We have about 4.9 billion in total debt. Uh, to break that down further, uh, 1.6 billion is related to the pension obligation bonds that we have, uh, you know, so that leaves about 3.3 billion uh, in capital related bonds. Um, and then if you take out the, uh, the Garvey bonds, the federal, the federal backed uh, grant anticipation bonds that we issue, that's about another 300. So we have about $3 billion of non Garvey capital bonds. To put that in perspective, you know, if we, uh, if we had had a capital program from the state uh, for 10 of the last 25 years, so there was like five years on, five years off, five years on, five years off, now we're five, five years back on. But if, if we would have had a continuous state program, we would have uh, not issued $2 billion of that total. Uh, so, you know, I think to your point, uh, the most critical kind of component here is a continuous state program uh, that, that we can rely on because, you know, we're, a, we're an older legacy system that requires a lot of additional capital improvements uh, and it's really that continuous state programming uh, that's critical for us to be able to continue to, 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 to whittle, you know, to, to maintain the system that we have, hopefully whittle away with additional funding as we move forward for a state of good repair project backlog that we have. Uh, but it's really that state programming. Um, the, the, the balance of what we have is, is the TIFIA related bonds that we've issued or debt that we've issued. Uh, that was really in conjunction with, in, in most cases, in conjunction with larger uh, federal grant programs that we were able to tap into as well. So, again, I think that the, the biggest thing here, uh, the biggest gating issue with regard to debt uh, is ensuring that the state has a robust capital program that we can rely on and, and one that really needs to grow because it's been relatively static, uh, you know, in its, uh, in its composition other than the addition of the uh, of the of the paygo funding that we now receive, you know, let me put a finer point on your question. I I understand exactly what you're what, what you're trying to get to. Um, I have no desire to issue debt. I issue debt because I have no other choice, and so if we have the type of capital program that Jeremy was mentioning on that would allow us to use other forms of funding to support our capital needs, I would certainly use that and that would be my priority. Um, we're in a very interesting period right now, um, not only in terms of the, the state capital program and certainly the PAYGO money gives us something that we never had before as, as you rightfully pointed out, which is a stable funding source that doesn't go away every five years. That certainly, I think, helps. It really does. Um, uh, it gives us the ability to plan and to be able to use those funds in ways that ultimately support our long-term capital objectives. It obviously isn't a, you know, it isn't a major portion of our capital program, which is the other challenge. Um, we also have been fortunate enough in the past year to get what is an historic level of federal funding approved by Congress, a numbers that I have never seen in my career uh, in terms of what's available out there right now for us to tap into. A large portion of that, as, as you've been hearing us talk about, is discretionary money. It's not formula money that's guaranteed to come to this region. 
our ability to match that discretionary money and ultimately to maximize the amount of money that comes to Chicago and to the state is also going to be very much dependent on our state capital program, which provides the, the bulk of our non-federal funding for this. Uh, and certainly, we should be having a conversation. And when I say we, I don't necessarily mean tr just transit, but roads, bridges, sewers, all of us should be having a conversation in Springfield about what we should be doing to make sure that we maximize the amount of money that comes back to the state and ultimately also comes back to RTA in this region. Um, there's an opportunity sitting out here right now that we need to really make sure we take advantage of. Uh, and that's separate apart from the conversations that we're having about our own operating uh, challenges as we go forward. Um, but yeah, we're in a very unique period right now. I've never seen anything like this before. And uh, woe for us if we don't take advantage of that. And if we do, to your point, yeah, I'll be using that money, not bonds, to pay for the capital programs that I want, that I, or projects that I want to implement. I have two questions. Um, the first one, as we look ahead to strategic plan, <clears throat> as we look ahead to looking for more funding, um, that's that's just a given. We have to we have to demonstrate and convince everyone of the importance of transit. That we Illinois doesn't survive without it. Um, Chicago doesn't survive without it. So we're looking for more funding. But in the meantime, are there any opportunities to reduce expenses? Um, do you look at that? Is there any way to, number one, just because it's a good idea to always reduce expenses where you can, number two, to extend the length of the uh, federal money before it runs out? Well, a couple, couple of points there. Um, one, I think, as you know, many of you know who, who have been on this board a long time, we've always been in a position of, I won't say financial crisis, but of penny pinching. Um, uh, you know, we, we run, compared to the metrics that I've looked at and most of our peers, we run, we, we run one of the most efficient transit systems in the country. Having said that, there's always opportunities to improve, and, and that's one of the reasons why we invest in technology and other things, because it does gener generate and drive um, uh, operating efficiencies for, for CTA. Um, the other thing that we recognize, of course, is that the mobility patterns of our customers and residents of the city are changing dramatically from what they were pre-pandemic. And there's a separate effort underway on our part to look at our overall service to see how we can better provide the service that meets the needs of what people want to do and where they want to go. Um, it may result in shifting of resources over time. I don't know that it'll necessarily result in a reduction of resources. Um, clearly, we, we are, are, are very much committed to maintaining the level of services that we have. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't find more ways to provide it more efficiently. And there's a lot that you're going to be hearing about from CTA over the course of the next year, particularly on the bus side of the house, of where we can look at improving our service and making sure it is much more aligned with what our customers want uh, uh, to do. And that, we believe, will obviously generate more ridership and more revenue to CTA to support the costs that we're that we are incurring. Thank you. And you just answered my second question, which is what the CTA is doing to well, first of all, a simple question. Do you consider your estimate for ridership by the end of 23 is conservative or optimistic? Conservative. Conservative. Um, uh, with with the caveat <laughs> with the caveat that I don't know what this pandemic is going to do to me over the course of the next year. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I, I am I am reminded every day that as much as we like to think we have it behind us, we don't. Um, there's a lot of talk about what may happen this winter and and how it may impact, um, um, you know, the country and the city as a whole. And obviously, I'm always concerned about what that may mean for my ridership. So. Um, you know, we, 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 we brought in um, a lot of analytical tools to develop our ridership numbers. Uh, we, 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 we had um, folks from MIT who do some very um, uh, sophisticated modeling to try to understand sort of what's going on with our ridership and how it's going to move forward. The thing that we don't really know yet, and that's, you know, 
just a challenge under under, under these circumstances. Is what's the ceiling here? When are we going to just see our ridership kind of plateau out? And you know, this is it. This is the new reality of where we're going to be. Um, but we're not waiting to figure that out to to start to develop the strategies on how we increase ridership because no matter what, we have to continue to find ways to grow that ridership. Uh, we need to implement strategies like the ones that you heard us talking about around our fares and, and other things uh, to encourage the type of regional mobility that ultimately supports not only CTA, but Metro and PACE. Um, I've always said that we are healthy as a group and we are weak as a group. And so having a healthy CTA and a weak Metro does not benefit CTA, nor does the other, nor, nor does vice versa benefit Metro. And so, you know, I'm talking to my counterparts uh, uh, regularly about what we can do to, you know, increase our mobility to make it easier for our customers to use our system and to ultimately try to increase the overall regional ridership to a level that ultimately is supportive of what we need to keep this keep the system running. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Kerry. And Dr. Gaining. Hi, I also want to commend you for your work in this uh, incredibly difficult environment and also voice my support for the red line extension. And I'm glad that there's such a fierce advocate for that project in CTA. My question is about the workforce shortage and you talked about um, hiring. Is that going to address all the underlying causes of the shortage? And if not, are there other things that you're looking at that might be uh, avail available to address the shortage? The, the, you're right to point out that the, the problem here isn't just a hiring problem. It's also a retention problem. Um, I'm hemorrhaging employees out the door almost as fast as I'm bringing employees in. And so, you know, in order to address the gap, I mean, I'm about a thousand, I'm, a, I'm about a thousand people down right now from where I want to be. So in order to, to address that gap, I have to also stop the, the outflow while building up the inflow. And to do that, you have to have a lot of conversations about what's driving people away from jobs in public transit. There are a lot of things that we know are, are causing that. Some of it is just the, the environment that we're in, you know, as a society and the, the way people treat each other and things that, that are happening that are abusive and inappropriate. Some of it is just the, the, the new risk of being a frontline employee in an era of a pandemic. You know, none of my employees signed up to, to take on a job that might kill them. Uh, and yet over the past, you know, several years, I've had a number of employees die and I've had over 4,000 employees get sick as a result of COVID. Um, some of it is just the day-to-day -day stress of operating in, a, in public transit. You know, a bus operator does not have an easy job. Uh, rail operators that have an easy job. There's a lot of stress that goes into that. And so I have been focused on things that I can do to help that. Um, I'm particularly focused on the mental health of my employees and, and working to put more resources in place to support them on that. And by resources, I mean not just the reactive EAP programs, but more proactive resources where we're actually going out and engaging our employees directly and checking on them, almost like a wellness check. Are you okay? You know, are things going on you need to talk about? Are things going on in your personal life? Many of our employees are not necessarily just facing work challenges. They're facing personal challenges because of all the other stressors that have been impacting us for the last several years. Uh, and then there's safety. You know, there's obviously concern about the safety of our employees. We're upgrading our bus shields for our bus operators, who are the most vulnerable frontline employees that I have in my system. But we're also being very aggressive in pursuing felony upgrades when someone attacks a CTA employee and making sure that the people who uh, do this are held accountable for it. Uh, we work very closely with the police department and, and the suburban police departments to make sure that we're identifying and arresting people who are who are engaging in inappropriate behavior on CTA. Um, and then, you know, the third piece of this, of course, is financial. Uh, I'm, I'm in the final stages of negotiating an agreement with the union that will provide not only hiring incentives, but retention incentives for my employees, putting premiums on certain types of work and certain types of jobs that make it more appealing for my employees to, to perform that work. And just as importantly, more appealing for them to stay. 
Um, so all of those are things that are in the works here to deal with the, the workforce shortages. There are obviously a number of other things that I didn't even mention that we're also working on, but I've certainly tasked, you know, Tom McCone, who's, who's my chief administrative officer, with really focusing all of my resources on what we can do to make CTA a, a better workplace for my employees and ultimately making sure that they know we appreciate the hard, dedicated work that they do every day. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Any other questions, comments? Yes, Dr. Kenny. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm glad to hear the focus is on finding the root cause of some of the employment issues. I think that's really critical instead of just assuming that we know it. Um, I want to go back to uh, the the bus fleet. So I, I am on a village board as well, and we just heard from our police and fire departments as they're looking to do their vehicle purchases um, that some of these purchases that they make right now are going to be delayed delivery until 2025 or later if they even know when they will arrive. Meanwhile, the costs are increasing. So how is that playing into? I know infrastructure is an issue for you, making sure that you have the infrastructure to support these purchases, but how is the potential delay in delivery impacting you as well? There, that, that certainly is an issue. Uh, the supply chain issues that I think are impacting industries all over the, the world uh, are certainly impacting our industry as well. Um, we're obviously in, in regular and, and constant communication with the bus manufacturers who build our, our, our bus vehicles, uh, as well as with our rail car manufacturer who builds our rail car. And, and, you know, as things stand right now, we're comfortable with where we are in terms of our delivery schedules and, and, and the timing for when we should receive our buses. But you're, you're absolutely right. It is a concern. It, it is, um, uh, something that I hear a lot at the industry level. Um, I, I am uh, I'm currently chairman of of our industry group, and so I attend a lot of conferences and meet with a lot of my peers, and we're all talking about these same issues. It it, it is you know, there's nothing that I'm talking about here today or that you'll hear from Pace from Metra that isn't happening to to our counterparts all over the country, and we all spend a lot of time talking amongst ourselves about how best to attack these things and what strategies may work and what strategies aren't working. Um, uh, this is one part of the challenges of the, of the you know, number of balls that I'm juggling in the air at any particular point in time. And certainly we have people who are keeping a close eye on that. Uh, and I will point out that it, it is an issue on the rolling stock side, but it's also an issue on our capital infrastructure side. Obviously the rising cost of materials and goods impacts my construction projects. Uh, and and I can tell you that the private sector in our industry has been very vocal about the fact that they need relief from our contracts because you know we do, we do a pretty good job of of making them airtight and locking them in to a price and saying we're not changing that no matter what. Um, but at the same time, we recognize that we can't destroy our industry and that there are very real factors that are occurring that are outside of any of our control that we have to provide relief for. So. Uh, there are there are unusual budgetary pressures on my capital budget that wouldn't normally be there, um, but I've got a really good team of people who manage that, and and certainly where we need to make adjustments, they'll be strategic and they'll be efficient uh, to manage our overall program. Dr. Corman, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, Dorval and <clears throat> the CTA team for being here for your presentation and explanation and. <clears throat> Um, when I was appointed uh, last year by the Cook County uh, Suburban Caucus at our committee meeting, um, when I was being appointed, there's a couple issues um, that I just would like to share that are obviously Im impact, you know, all the service boards. And pretty much so, um, two of them was the decarbonization electrification, which you covered, and um, and then also safety, mm -hmm. you know, seemed to be a, a really prominent um, issue. Um, and in your action plan, you mentioned the upgrades, you know, improved con customer experience, cons um, um, consistent services, <clears throat> in, you know, to attract, you know, along with safe, safety and secure um, to attract riders back. Um, I guess my point being is, you know, without a safe and secure system, all the other efforts, you know, fly out the window. Mm -hmm. um, unless we really have a trusted and secure system. And obviously it's a much bigger issue and, you know, it's something that's rippling, you know, into um, 
transit, you know, all over. Um, you mentioned that there was a triple, you, you tripled the investment, you know, in, in a safe and secure um, system. It, do you feel that's sufficient? And are you seeing any impact um, to the positive, you, you know, with that investment? Boy, that's a terrific question. <laughs> do I think it's sufficient? Um, uh, I don't know if it's going to be sufficient. Um, that's why we've been increasing it every year because we realize that we need to do more. Um, your your assessment of what you're hearing is spot on with what we're hearing from our surveys and customer feedback tools as well. That the number one concern there are two there are two top concerns that they have right now. One is service reliability, and the other is safety and security. Now, it's worth mentioning that. We carry 900,000 people a day. 900,000 people is the equivalent of the city of Indianapolis on a daily basis. And when you, when you put the crime on CTA in the context of 900,000 people who use it every day, crime is relatively small. Having said that, we all recognize that any crime is a problem for CTA. Uh, and for any other transit system. And so you have to still aggressively attack it no matter how big or small it is. But I, I, I do like to make the point because the media certainly spends a lot of time and energy talking about every criminal incident that happens on CTA. But the majority of our riders ride CTA every day and they do not have a bad experience in terms of crime or safety. Now, perception is reality. And the perception out there is that there are, you know, very real concerns about the safety of being on CTA. We have to turn that reality around. A big part of that is making sure that we're showing people in a very visible way that we're doing the things that we can to keep them safe. And so, you know, with the technology and other things that I'm doing and the, 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 you know, the, the work we've done with the police department to give them access to our entire camera system. And, and I could sit here today and tell you about incidents that have occurred on CTA where the use of that system has prevented a crime from occurring, not just captured the crime after it, after it occurred. Um, the, real, the real issue here is that it's boots on the ground. It's, it's people out there being visible, you know, being seen and being known as someone that, that's looking out for your safety. That's why we've expanded our unarmed security guards to 300 from, you know, from you know, a little over 100 a few years ago. Is why I've added the K-9 units, um, uh, for which there'll be 50 teams of one dog and two uh, security guards fully deployed by the end of this year. Uh, and it's why we're gonna continue to look at other things that we can do, be it signage, be it um, social services, being the other things that we know tend to impact people's feelings about safety, while also continuing to get customer feedback on whether any of it's working. So to your point, do I know if it's working? I know it's working when my customers say they feel safer. Um, um, and we're doing surveys regularly now to, to measure exactly that. It's really hard to measure what doesn't happen on your system. In other words, you know, what crime got prevented because I had a security guard someplace or because there's a police officer somewhere is something you, that's really not measurable. Um, but we do measure and we continue to measure the, the work that our, our contractors do on a daily basis. Where are they making contacts? What are what are what incidents are they addressing? How are they addressing them? Um, what are our CSAs and other people seeing? Uh, we monitor them through our camera system to see that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, that they're doing the work that we expect that they're going to be doing. Uh, and we review, and I should point out this. We review, and when I say we, I mean I personally review every criminal incident that occurs on CTA. I get the video, I look at it, I have conversations with my staff about what we can do to prevent that from happening again, and we take action to address that. It is an ongoing process that obviously I wish would end at some point in time, but um, we'll continue to keep at it and keep working, this, working the problem as, as much as possible until we get it solved. Thank you for your obvious co commitment to that and um, very important, but um, just one um, other question. Um, you mentioned 1.2 billion in federal relief to balance the budget over 23 through 25. What about beyond that? 
I mean, are, are we going to rely on federal money coming in after that point, or I mean, what's the anticipation without having a global ball or one in the lottery? Right. I, I think um, <laughs> well, lottery would be good, but <laughs> um, um, you're referring to what we all tend to talk about in the industry as the fiscal cliff. Um, uh, we've done a we've done probably a better job than many in our industry of pushing that out as far as we have. And the reason that we did it is because it buys us time to fix the bigger problem, which is what you're you're working on uh, with your strategic plan, which is what we're working on with CMAP in terms of a broader regional approach to dealing with this. And the reality is that if we don't if we don't come up with a long term revenue fix for our operations, then we're going to have some draconian decisions that we'll be making um, in 2026. And by draconian, I mean things that go way beyond anything that you ever used to hear me talk about when I was here talking about doomsday budgets and things of that nature for those of you who've been around long enough <laughs> to remember those days. This, is, this will be doomsday budget on steroids. Um, uh, I honestly don't know how we keep a system running if we're facing multi hundred million dollar deficits um, four or five years from now. But the good news is we have time to do it. Normally when we're having these conversations, we're right up against the margin right then and there. And it's sort of like, you know, you, you bail us out or we shut down. We're not in that position now. I'm very confident about the, the, the conversations that we're having now. I'm confident we're gonna to put together a strategy that will be successful just like we have in the past. And that we'll be able to go, to get, go down to Springfield as a group, united, to get the funding and the structural stability that we need to make sure that we really do sort of mitigate our need to have these conversations in the future. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Director uh, Ross. I'd like to join my colleagues in complimenting you for your leadership. Um, two areas I want to mention specifically one is the manner in which you continued service during the pandemic. That didn't just assist city writers, that also helped people who live in the suburbs. And I can attest to that personally from some people who came in from Will County specifically to work in the medical district. So my compliments for that. Since you've been in this chair, you have talked about equity as one of the hallmarks of your administration. And I think that's evidenced today by the work that you're doing with making the stations accessible and also, of course, the red line extension. And I do have one request for you, and I think you just touched on it a minute ago, and that is, as you know, the RTA is working on a strategic plan um, with seven uh, action and seven advocacy steps, which I think provide an excellent platform and framework for us to tell our story uh, to our writers, to the public, and in Springfield. And so I would just encourage you and the other service boards to give us your input on that and then be prepared to embrace it fully and help us tell that story. I think that gives us the best chance that we're going to have to achieve the kind of success and obtaining additional funding, which as you just pointed out, we all need. None of those seven action or advocacy steps, frankly, are going to happen unless there's sufficient funding to allow those things to happen. So that would be my request of you and the other service boards as well. Well, first of all, let me um, let me thank you for your for your comments and remarks. Um, there's no question that we will be supportive of and will embrace the RTA strategic plan. Um, I think Leanne and, and her team have done an excellent job of working with us and, and in particular keeping me informed of the progress on the plan and the work that we're doing. Um, I certainly appreciate the challenges of trying to navigate through all of the various stakeholders and, and, and positions to come up with some sort of vision on where we're going at the region in the future. And I also believe that it is critical to our long-term success. You, you, you mentioned a couple of times, you know, the, you made a comment about tell, we need to tell our story. And I was smiling because um, at the national level, where I'm having a similar conversation about federal funding for transit, my key point 
to the industry has been, we have to tell our story. Um, because our story resonates in ways that a lot of the numbers and the other things that data and everything else we talk about don't. Because at the end of the day, what I know elected officials care about are their constituents, their people. And at the end of the day, that's what we're all about. We're about people. We're about communities. It isn't, you know, it's, it's expensive to fund us, but the benefits that come from that funding are magnified tenfold. And I'm looking forward to working with, with, with Leanne and working with RTA as we tell our story here in Chicago and in this region, uh, and then using that story and amplifying that story to get the resources that we need, not only in Springfield, but also in D.C., where I think our story will resonate very strongly, and I know it does resonate already very strongly with the funding request that we need to make. So we're 100% there. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, I, have a, I have a couple, uh, Mr. President. Number one is um, there was an op-ed piece in the Tribune this week, and I think you've answered perhaps the question today, but it was it was saying that L.A., Boston, and New York from a FTA program have received many more dollars than we have at the CTA uh, for electric buses. Is there is there a, a quick answer you have to that other than what we've heard this morning? Well, I think the the, the quick answer to that is that that's one year's of, one year year of funding in a multi-year discretionary program. Uh, rest assured that by the time that program comes to the end in five years, CTA and the city of Chicago will have their fair share of those discretionary dollars. Don't judge us by how we start, judge us by how we finish. Got it. The, uh, I do like your idea on messaging, that uh, especially saying that we are 50 times cleaner so to speak, than uh, private vehicles in, in and around our metropolitan Chicago area. Um, that's, a, uh, that's a real good one. Um, I just want to say to the members here and to the public, um, I've always believed in whatever business we're in, one of the greatest judges of how someone is doing comes from their peers. Uh, and Dorval is the president of the American Public Transportation Association, uh, which I think uh, speaks volumes, uh, you know, in terms of how he's viewed nationally. Um, I'm lucky, as is Leanne, that we get to talk to our counterparts in New York and L.A. and even Peoria and the Quad Cities. Uh, and there is no operator of a public transit system in this country uh, that's probably more respected uh, than uh, than President Carter. And I, I just uh, I commend you for taking on that task. Uh, and, uh, you know, you are clearly a leader nationwide. And we always uh, here at the RTA um, and at the CTA, you know, there's no there's no plagiarism in the transit business. <laughs> if uh, another city has a great idea, Dorval and Jeremy and uh, Michelle, they're all gonna they're all gonna pick up on it and, and use it here. Uh, so uh, you know, I thank you. Hang in there. It's uh, it's uh, it's it's a it's a tough world out there. Um, but uh, you know, I thank you. And we have a you know, Dorval and I, I, I very much appreciate the fact too um, that anytime I ever email them or text them or uh, give them a, and the, you know that a boy uh, type uh, type pat on the back, um, he always responds. And uh, I very much appreciate that, uh, Mr. Carter. As same with your staff. So, thank you. Anything else for the, the CTA? If not, uh, hang in there and uh, go serve the public like you and your employees do every day. Thanks Thank so much. You. Thank you. And, and I certainly am appreciative of and, and value the support that this board has given CTA um, both this year and in the years in the past. And we look forward to working with you all in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. All right. Next up, um, let's do pace. Uh, Melinda Metzger, uh, the executive director, and Lori Newsom, uh, the chief financial officer and diversity and equity and inclusion officer, I think are going to present. She may have other um, folks with her, but uh, let's hear from pace. Sure, sure. 
Melinda, why don't you wait about two minutes? A couple of uh, folks may have needed a biological break here at the. Uh... Thank you. Maybe they heat Monday for lunch. So, um, um, El Canto, is that okay? It's right, right by you. Yeah, right, you want to do so, to at noon, okay? Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I got to say, reservation, the Union League Club, where I might have had us go in the private dining room, it's closed on Mondays, which tells us clearly uh, traffic patterns of, you know, when the Union League shuts down their restaurant, they know no one's coming into the office. Uh, Mondays like they used to. No, they don't. I can do it. Mondays I drive it. Mondays I see trip. But yeah. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are always hard. Yeah, no, absolutely. But I'll see you at uh, noon on, on Monday. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Going on Mondays and it's empty. Yeah, I came. I, I had to drive in Monday and it was um, it was clear sailing. I was stunned. He had to be down at Rush. Uh, and uh, I don't know, it's clear sailing. Fridays at the law firm are ghost town. I'm gonna wait for one more director, Melinda. And when you start talking, they'll they're speaking, they'll hopefully run in. Remember that director Canty when you get to the Illinois House? <laughs> 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 Better him run in than run out. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, Melinda, thank you um, for waiting for patiently. Uh, it's, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. With me, I have Lori Newson, who is our Chief Financial Officer and also our Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility Officer. And you may very well know her because we stole her from the RTA, and we appreciate it. That was a very good gift. Um, and to my left is um, Melanie Castle, who's our Head of Budget and did all the work in gathering our budget together and has a great team who really did a good job. So with that, I'm going to begin since everyone's back. As PACE moves towards historic capital infrastructure improvements, service innovations, and ridership recovery, I am pleased to be here today to report that PACE's budget is balanced with no fare increase. I'm excited to share the many positives included in this budget, but first I want to call attention to what has been quite a year of firsts for PACE. We opened our first fixed route garage in over 30 years on October 24th in Plainfield. We opened our first transit center in Joliet, making connections safer and more convenient for our riders. This year also marked the first time a sitting U.S. Secretary of Transportation has visited a PACE facility. We received our first raise grant to help fund the construction of an intermodal facility in collaboration with Metro and the city of Harvey. We entered the era of electrification with the demonstration and then the purchase of our first electric bus. We implemented new partnerships with TNCs, such as Uber and a new one called User. We developed a new van pool concept called Van Go, where you can reserve a vehicle that can be assessed, re accessed remotely to be used as a first mile, last mile transit option. We developed our first Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility. We launched partnerships with community colleges for operator and maintenance personnel recruitment. And finally, for the first time since March of 2020, PACE's system reached ridership of 70% of our pre-pandemic level. And that's really, I'm thrilled to see that. I'm proud of what we've achieved in 2022, and I'm even more excited about what 2023 will bring. Next slide, please. PACE's 2023 budget includes a fully funded operational budget of $303.4 million in suburban service and $238.5 million in ADA paratransit service and a strong 72.4 million capital program that allocates 60 million for the electrification of our Pace North Division garage in Waukegan. Pace held eight public hearings, four in person and four virtual to present our proposed 2023 budget. And I'm encouraged by what we heard. We received dozens of comments from parties who want us to reinstate service that has been suspended for more than two years. It's a good thing when people want more public transit available to them. And while the demand for those services do not warrant reinstatement at this time, it is good news that we have some flexible, lower cost options to offer those commuters, such as On Demand and Van Gogh. While this budget includes the difficult decision to discontinue services that have been suspended since 2020, we are reimagining our system through a network revitalization initiative to better meet the needs of the region. We'll continue to pilot innovative alternative services and technologies, including TNC partnerships, on-demand services, mobility as a service platforms, a MOS platform that will help our riders plan their trips and will make our system more accessible. 2023 will also launch our network revitalization initiative, which I mentioned earlier. This study will identify the productive service and useful services our region needs to continue our recovery and thrive in the coming years. All of this would not be possible without the amazing employees we're lucky to have at PACE. While 70% of our workforce is diverse and reflective of the communities we serve, we can and should do more to promote and retain a diverse workforce. And we've been doing that. In 2022, we worked with Olive Harvey College, Harper College, and several technical institutes to address our workforce shortage. And we have many more partnerships to come in 2023. Next slide, please. In 
As I mentioned, there were there are no fare increases included in the budget. In fact, PACE plans to make it even more affordable to use public transportation. In 2022, we partnered with CTA for lower pass prices, partnered with CTA and Metra for regional connect passes, and PACE implemented a lower van pool fare for riders who commute less than five days per week. In 2023, we will be eliminating transfer costs for riders who transfer from one regular PACE route to another and lowering other transfer costs. And we'll continue to partner with CTA on new money saving options such as a one day and three day passes that allow unlimited rides on both services. While previously waived, the Taxi Access Program or TAP and the DePage Uber Access Program fares will be reinstated. However, they will remain lower than the original $3 fare. There'll be a $2 fare on those services. <clears throat> I wanna thank the Arte and the other service boards for their collaboration on these fare changes that help connect our region, grow collective ridership and make it easier for everyone to use our multimodal system. Next slide, please. PACE's capital program consists of environmentally conscious projects designed to reduce our carbon footprint, strengthen our infrastructure, improve connections, and expand service options. PACE will invest significant resources into electrification of our North Division garage in Waukegan, which will be the foundational project for electrifying the whole region and bringing the agency to our goal of zero emission by 2040. We will have 21 electric buses in service throughout the region in 2023. We'll move forward on the construction of our South Campus ADA transfer centers in both Calumet City and Schaumburg, just to name a few. We'll design the new Harvey Transit Center with our partners Metro and the City of Harvey and move forward on three new pulse lines, which provide faster and more frequent service, including the Pulse Dempster line, which will begin service next year. Finally, we will begin the thoughtful process of evaluating our entire system in a genuine effort to listen to the needs of our passengers, potential new riders, and other stakeholders to create innovative services that work well for an even, even greater number of people. PACE service will not look the same as it did prior to COVID-19, nor should it. Our world has changed and we are changing with it. It is important that we focus on the implementation of innovative programs to meet the redefined needs of those we serve. At the, end of the work, uh, at the end of this work, we hope our newly devised service options will carry more people and offer more option to our region. We'll do all of this with safety, accessibility, efficiency, equity, and the environment at the forefront. With that, I will turn it over to Lori Newsom, PACE's Chief Financial Officer, um, she'll go through some of the budget highlights. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you. It certainly is uh, nice to visit a home that you grew up in. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Um, and um, so good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, I would like to thank um, RTA staff, along with my colleagues at Metra and uh, CTA in this se budget season to collaborate and get to a balanced regional budget. So thank you so much. I will start this morning with an overview of the suburban bus, the suburban service, uh, so suburban service budget before moving on to the ADA and the capital budgets. Looking at the 2022 estimates compared to the budget, 22 operating revenue is expected to come in at about 31.9 million, which is about 1.1 million above the 2022 budget. When the budget was built, operating expenses were expected to end at the year around 276.4 million, which is essentially at budget. PACE's total 2022 public funding estimate is 217.1 million. The 2022 RTA sales tax estimate is about $5.8 million higher than the revised 2022 budget approved by RTA this spring. We expect to need about 27.3 of our federal relief funding by year end. Moving ahead to 2023, the operating revenue is expected to increase by 4.58% with overall suburban service ridership expected to come in about 1.8% above 2022 estimates. Operating expenses are expected to increase by 9.8% in 2023, which is driven by our continued plan 
to increase hiring, service adjustments, and significant administrative support for technology efforts and the future post service engineering and design efforts. In 2023, public funding, including sales tax and other federal funding, is expected to stay flat in 2022, increasing only about 0.4%. PACE will use federal relief funding to make up the shortfall of public funding revenue, which is expected to be fully exhausted by 2025. Next slide, please. Now let's visit the ADA paratransit budget. The 2022 ADA paratransit budget plan for base ridership to be at about 80% of the pre-pandemic actual and the reinstatement of the RTA certification trips. However, the base ridership is expected to end this year at 15.2% above budget, which is about 93% of the pre-pandemic actual. And the RTA certification program was reinstated during the second quarter of the year. Operating revenue is expected to end this year around 476,000 under budget, which aligns with the timing of the reinstatement of the RTA certification program. Expenses are expected to finish the year about 5.9 million favorable. We expect to generate about $2.2 million of surplus funding, which, be, which will be added to the ADA paratransit reserve. For 2023, operating expenses is expected to grow by $3.9 million from 2022 estimate. PACE expects overall ridership to grow 6.8% from 2022. The expected 2023 ridership will bring PACE back to the pre-pandemic based ridership. The funding requirement of the $225.9 million is fully funded by sales tax and state funding. Next slide. Thank you. Finally, we will review the capital program with you. As Melinda mentioned previously, we have a robust capital program planned for 2023 in the amount of $72.4 million, of which $60.5 million is dedicated to the electrification of our North Division garage in Waukegan. Now, the overall 2023 to 2027 five-year capital budget totals $381.7 million, .381 million, primarily funded with the federal formula and the pay, state pay goal. Major projects in the five-year program include $60 million for electric buses, $19.6 million for the 2024, in 2024 for the post-95th construction, plus an additional $36 million in 2024 to further support the electrification of the North Division garage. In 2025, $16 million is programmed for the renovation at Pace facilities and $17 million for I-294 station construction in conjunction with the Tollway Tri-State Widening Project. Starting in 2025 and through 2027, South Div Southwest Division electrification expansion is planned to be funded with about $94 million. Further advance in PACE's system-wide zero emission commitment and goal. This concludes the highlights of PACE Suburban Bus and 88 operating budgets and the five-year capital program. I'll turn it back over to Melinda for final remarks. Thank you very much, Lori. At the end of the day, our hope is everything we do positively, positively impacts our riders, employees, communities, and the region. As you can see from the budget presented today, we've placed a focus on creating a transit system that supports both the current and future needs of our riders. We all know that about the financial challenges we will face at the end of 2025. I look forward to working with RTA, CMAP, and our sister agencies to secure the funding we need in order to continue operating a regional transportation system that drives our economy and supports the residents of Northeastern Illinois. Next slide, please. With, with that, we'll be, out, um, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Melinda. Uh, I mean, it was great to be with you and Harvey for uh, tremendous improvements uh, down there about a week or so ago in your new garage. Uh, that 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 was 
amazing that opening and that facility is so long overdue but it's incredible questions or comments for Rick Marks? yes pat carry director carry thank you uh for your presentation um in you talked about a network revitalization program and uh, we all know that all three service bureaus, we talked a little bit about this with CTA and we will with Metro, I'm sure, uh, the need to change the way services work. Um, the commuting patterns, travel patterns have changed. Um, in looking at your budget, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it looked like you were going out for a request for proposal for this study and expected to start perhaps in the spring of 23? Correct. And you anticipated it was a 24-month project? Correct. Um, that seems like a long time. Uh, things have changed today, and 24 months from now, we'll be on the verge of the fiscal cliff. Um, is it possible to shorten that up? Do you anticipate is 24 months the worst case? And also, as you go through this, will you be? Will it be an incremental? Like if you discover something, you'll start to implement it. I know you're already implementing changes. It just seems seems like a long time. Yeah, thank you very much for your question. I agree. We'd like to shorten it if we can. And I will say we are looking at the system. We have about 70 routes in our budget that we're cutting out because they're just not working. And we're reallocating service to other places where we need it. The big problem that PACE and every transit agency in the United States has is people. Um, people to drive the bus, people to maintain the buses. So we're doing some things that are different, that what I want to call outside the bus. Um, we're taking vans that we have, because our van pool program was significantly shrunk due to, to COVID-19. People aren't going to work every day anymore. They're working from home. So we have vans available. We're doing, as I said, remote start, where you can sign up with the program. You can get off Metra take one of our vehicles, call the night before, and we'll give you a code to get into the vehicle. Um, we're doing more with our on-demand services. We went with our van pool services. We brought in a half fare because people aren't going to work every day. They don't want to pay for five days to go to work. That has increased our van pool program immediately. We saw a change. Um, so we are looking at the system. We're looking what we can do to change routes. Some of the services that aren't working, we're reducing and moving the, that manpower to where uh, it's needed right away in COVID. Instead of us just saying, okay, all of our services are out of there, when we started to see our, our driver numbers shrink, we really started to right-size our agency to the number of employees we have. We're going to continue to do those studies. We're going to continue to look at what routes are working, where we can add, where some routes are better. We'll add the, the personnel to those routes and move um, drivers around to different areas. So we are looking at it. We definitely um, will approach this uh, study that we're starting and, and see once we get a consultant on board, see if we can shrink the time. That would be great. Appreciate that answer. Um, one other question in terms of changing services there, and I'm sure the route I'm very familiar with in Grays Lake 570 isn't the only one. Um, but as you order, I, I see go down Center Street with Nobody in it, one person, two people, maybe three. Um, as you order, and I know you're looking at on demand, and I'm sure you're looking at ways to, it's a critical service to take CLC and get them out to the west part of the county. Um, so it's kind of a two part. Well, I think you've answered the question that you're looking at other ways to maybe provide that. So I understand that. But as you're ordering buses, whether they be uh, diesel, CNG, or electric, um, is it possible? to have a smaller bus? No. Two answers to that. One is, the first answer is that Pace has the largest fleet of small buses um, in the country, 30-foot uh, buses versus 40-foot buses. Second part of the answer to the question is the cost of the, of the service. What drives it is, the, is the cost of the driver itself. So getting a smaller bus doesn't necessarily make it cheaper to operate. Um, the other, I'm going to add one more thing to it. We had services where you had 40-foot buses and it was fully loaded and we need, you know, more buses. COVID has changed that. Okay. Some areas it hasn't. On our bus on shoulder, um, we're running service where we're now starting to see the ridership come back. The problem for us, and again, our sister agencies, is it's not coming back Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. 
And so having the driver there during the right period of time is very difficult for operations. And we're trying to address those patterns and see what we can do with that, along with our unions, because we have union contracts right. which guarantee how our employees work. So we have to continue to work through that. Is your estimate of the ridership at the end of 23, is that conservative or? It's conservative. And as I said, I was really pleased to see us back to about 70% of our pre-pandemic level in October. I hope that continues. Okay. Time will tell. That's okay. one month. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Director Holt. Continuing a little bit on uh, Director Carey's uh, questions about uh, ridership, could you talk a little bit more about your expectations for what future ridership is going to look like, not just within the next couple of year period, but you know, I think all of us recognize that commuting patterns have changed, work patterns have changed, and it's interested in your thoughts and your planning for what that's going to look like for PACE going forward. Well, I think that I'm very lucky to have the helm of PACE because we have a lot of tools in our tool shed. What I'm talking about, we have the van pill program, we have an on-demand program, we have our ADA service, we have dial -a ride service, we have regular pace routes and we have express routes and we also do some carpool work. So I see when we come out of the pandemic fully, the commute patterns are gonna be totally different and we're in a great place to take our resources and move them around and address that difference. I also wanna point out one thing that our ADA service will be next year back to pre-pandemic levels. We're really close right now. And why that's so difficult for us is we're running 100% of the ridership with 30% less drivers. And so we're looking at some new ways to move people in the region. As I mentioned, we're using Uber. Um, we just hired a new TNC, which will come in line um, in December called User. Um, we work with, we have 70 contracts with municipalities where we provide the vehicle and they, they pick up people. So we have dial ride services. So I see when we come out of this, it's going to be totally different than when we started this in 2019, 2020. Um, and hopefully better. That's our goal. Any other questions, comments? Yes, Director Borman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Melinda and team, congratulations on, you know, fine presentation and, you know, all your efforts and everything that you're doing. It's been interesting over the years to watch PACE and how it's evolved. And you guys um, have always been really good financial stewards. And then it's kind of got frustrating, I know, over the years when you really weren't rewarded for, you know, all your good deeds, you know. But just to see this evolution in the work that you're doing is, is very impressive. And, you know, to have 70% ridership, you know, it really speaks volumes about the services you provide and how the community really depends on um, the service. And I also just want to, you know, a comment, you know, to um, acknowledge your commitment um, to about 83% of your capital um, develop, um, development project going, you know, towards that north region, it, it, um, 60 million out of the 72 million and um, for, you know, in pursuit of decarbonization, um, even though decarbonization isn't always economically friendly, um, you know, you guys are really, you know, seem to be, you know, on a plan and a path, you know, forward. So, um, you know, and then just being able to redefine your needs, you know, just showing how adaptable and agile that PACE really is, you know, but um, I just want to acknowledge and thank you for your services. Thank you very much, Director. Thank you. Director Carey. I have a few more questions. Um, I think they'll be pretty simple, but the, the TEP, you, you cut the fare down to $2 instead of 3 What's why and will it go back up to three at some point? Good question, thank you. So during COVID, we tried to have everyone ride on one vehicle as, a, as opposed to a group right. ride. So we took it down to zero so people would use the cab services and our Uber services. Um, we feel now we need to bring it up. There should be a fare on it. Why didn't we go back to the $3 fare? Again, it gets back to not having enough drivers. We wanna divert people from the system that we have operating with our drivers onto taxis and Ubers if we can, and if they choose to do so. So that's why the fare is lower. For this year, our board has set it at $2. They could change it. I don't foresee that, but right now it will be $2 this year, and then we'll see what next year brings. Okay. 
And, and then a general question about are there opportunities to reduce expenses anywhere at all? Um, and you move some uh, traditionally capital uh, dollars into your expenses, into other expenses. And why did you do that too? Um, well, I'm going to jump on what Director Gorman said. PACE has really been an excellent steward of money. Um, and we're always looking at ways to, to save money in our budget. Why did we move some of these, these capital items into our operating budget? Because we needed to move them along, because we think in the long run, if we get this technology in place, it will save us money. So there was some rationale to do this. Um, and is that, if I could interrupt you, is that technology to help uh, facilitate your capital projects? Or um, some are, so, some some are, some as technology, um, you know, to improve our computer systems. We're using technology in all new ways and that we haven't done in the past. Our camera systems, our radio systems, and you know, for security around our buildings. So we're we're using this money to update our computer systems so we can do more with it. Um, so we're, we will continue to look at that, but on the other end of the pendulum is the fact that our wages are going up. They have to go up to be competitive, and parts and construction, everything is going up. So we have to make sure that we can balance this. Okay, okay. But anything that wouldn't have to do with keeping the buses running, I mean, you haven't added incremental positions. I mean, you, right. We, we have not. We want to staff up to where we should be. Or, you know, okay. across the board, we are, are down positions. Okay. It's no. really hard to attract people. Really right appreciate now. your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Director Ross, you have a question or comment? More of a comment than a question. In our strategic plan, we talk a lot about using equity as a lens for evaluating services. And yet, because of fair box recovery um, requirements, you know, it's difficult probably to hang on the routes that we should hang on to for purposes of equity. I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. And I think that's something that we will be looking at with the RTA. Um, you know, having a fair box recovery ratio may not balance with the equity issues that we have to address. And we look at every route that we're eliminating to see if there are other options um, in, that we can do with our van pool program or some other program. But definitely the, the fair box recovery ratio becomes an issue if you're trying to, to look at equity. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Uh, if not, thank you very, very much for uh, being here today and uh, your efforts every day. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I have one more plug. On December 7th seems to be a very busy day. We're going to have an open house at our Plainfield garage from, I think, 10 to 1, and we're going to be sending out invites to everyone here if you'd like to see a brand new, beautiful garage. And 20 years from now, that garage will look the same way because we take very good care of our facilities. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Melita. Thank you very much. All right. I saw Jim Derwinski back there somewhere, our wonderful Metra Executive Director. Thanks, Mr. Dwinsky. You can introduce your team. I see Janice there. Yeah, good morning, um, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. It is incredible to see you all in person. <laughs> I say that for the last year, every meeting I go to, but it, it is so true. It's uh, This is the way business is supposed to be conducted. Uh, those little boxes that we've been using, functional, but not as productive. With me today is uh, Janice Thomas. She's our Deputy Executive Director of External Affairs. Um, and that doesn't really describe all what she does. She runs our entire capital program now, our government side, our communication side. So anything touching um, anything outside the agency, it's in Janice's bailiwick. Next to me is our new CFO, John Morris, new to uh, Metra. And uh, next to uh, John is our Senior Director of Budget, Alan Ochab. 
And also with us here today, I have Mike Gillis from our media team. But on behalf of all the entire Metro staff and our PSA carriers, BNSF and UP, I'd like to uh, present to you uh, this year's um, this budget. Um, to say COVID changed everything is an understatement. So I'll start off with, next slide please, with really taking a look at Metro strategic plan. Along with the RTA, we've been very diligently working on the strategic plan and what a time to do it. Um, our first ever strategic plan spanned from 17 to 22. But now to really rethink what is Metro, what is transit, what is, what, where do we sit in the region? Um, there was never a better time to do this than coming out of this pandemic and all that we've learned into this. So the highlights of the strategic plan are listed there. Um, this week, we've finished the public comment section. We've pivoted a lot on, on some of the uh, ideologies in the strategic plan. And one of the ones I really wanna uh, focus in on is the uh, being socially responsible. Um, we've really taken a look at what does Metro, what can we provide? What are we known for? And what are we really good at? And I've heard a lot of great discussion here with the other two service boards today. So next slide, please. First and foremost, uh, we, we partnered with APTA. Um, as you mentioned, uh, President Carter now chairs APTA. We've been members along with the RTA with APTA for many, many years. APTA put forth a racial equity commitment pilot. Um, within that early per period of time, we signed up for it. We didn't sign up for it because we wanted to be riding on someone else's coattails. We had already been working on our own uh, equity inclusion plans here. We believe that our, our enhanced plans here are also going to help um, structure some of the conversation that APTA will have with the rest of the country. Next slide, please. So our diversity, equity, inclusion action plan is very robust. Um, it started with really taking a look at the agency. Hiring an outside counsel, we, we brought in uh, RJ Harris, a local a company within the region that really works with public transportation. We had done work with him before on some uh, other issues and we, we liked working with him. And so in this partnership, we really move forward and we are committed um, to have a diversity, equity, inclusion officer on board here shortly. We are just now starting to roll out uh, training mass across the, the company, but not just for the employees. We're working with the board. We're also working with an idea of everything should change with the vendors. We need to be better payers. We need to be better uh, looking at our contracts. We need to be better looking in the community. What we can and can't control, as obviously there's a lot of strings tied to uh, public dollars. Next slide, please. So this is Metro's workforce. Um, it, it represents the, the geographic region we're in. Uh, 39% Caucasian, 33% African American, 25% Hispanic, and then 2% uh, Asian and others. So um, we do really have a workforce that really blends well with the uh, areas that we, we represent here. And we've been working with um, different agencies to take a look at how we do our hiring. Um, so it's, it's like everybody's been having hiring, Problems are, are not unique to uh, Metro in the region, but to continue to have a much more diverse workforce, how can we get in and start attracting some people that maybe traditionally wouldn't be looking at the railroad or, or transit as an option? So we've been trying to work with some professionals and try to get our name out there in many different venues uh, so that we can start really attracting a much more diverse uh, uh, workforce. Next slide, please. So one of the, where the rubber meets the road, or in our case, the steel meets the rail, um, is our DBE commitments. And I'm very proud to say that at just under 47 million, this is Metro's highest year ever of DBE participation. You can see the numbers up there and how they break down. Next slide, please. And we didn't meet our federal goals and we did exceed our non-federal established goals. Um, Janice used to run our DBE program, um, and now she's got a, a wonderful leader there in Shante Williams that's, that's doing a, a remarkable job. I can tell you that uh, Janice taught a lot of uh, our current vendors on uh, about the program and how to participate in the program, and Shante continues down that path. Uh, very proud of the virtual work we were able to do over the last two years with the DBE community, um, having virtual events, and now finally getting back into the in-person events to really open up those opportunities. So next slide, please. I'll get you in now to what we're here for the budget. So our operating budget at 980 million, it has a uh, no fare increase. And 
we had a pilot that started here in July called a hundred dollar super saver monthly pass. It did tie into the regional connect pass where with Metra on a monthly pass, you can access CT and pace for 30 extra dollars. So really for $130 you can access the entire transit network. Um, we're starting to see some adaptation of that. We're actually increasing messaging on our trains about that in case people didn't know about that. But our board decided to keep the $100 Super Saver Pass. Um, public comments supported that as well. And we're gonna retain our 10 and $6 all day passes. This is totally different from the 10 zone system that we traditionally used. Um, those Fair products still exist. If you want to get a one-way ticket from Woodstock, you can still buy a one-way ticket from Woodstock, but these other fair products are out there and they're really um, helping define what the new ridership patterns are going to look like. Our budget has just under 9% increase from last year, mostly due to inflationary uh, items, medical fuel and insurance, and then of course the contractual increases that we see on a normal year. It does fund pre-pandemic service level. So today we're running 582 uh, revenue trains. We're, we're projecting to get that back up to about 700. Um, hiring has been an issue, but I'll be talking to that about in a second, um, taking a look at some of our initiatives moving into the into 23 with regard to our service levels. And we project starting the year around 40% of pre-pandemic ridership from a budgetary standpoint and ending the year at 55%. Capital budget will be a little over 500 million for the 23 year. Next slide, please. So this is what operating looks like. The vast majority, as always, is going to be in operations and maintenance with the vast majority of that, obviously, labor. And admin takes a, a good chunk of that as well. Diesel fuels up significantly, about 30%. Um, obviously, we all can feel the price of that at the pump. And claims and insurance continue to rise. Uh, we're starting to see a lot more of this, what they call post-COVID uh, nature of uh, what happens in, in, the, in the lawsuits. All right, moving uh, to the next slide, please. The sources that we're using, system revenue is going to come in at 216, we estimate, at the uh, forecast ridership. Sales tax has been very strong. Um, one of the bright spots of everything through COVID is the, the rise in sales tax, and it's been incredible. I thank you all for your online sales. And the COVID relief will we'll expend 240 projected. That's going to leave us at just under 600 million of federal COVID relief as we um, end 22 um, into 23. And that's going to get us in, we think, the third quarter of 25. Next slide, please. So we put together a lot of service restoration principles. We did this in the beginning. I, for one, will tell you when COVID hit, I didn't think we were going to be doing this nowhere near this long. I think a lot of us had projections and we were all wrong. We continue to uh, be wrong even as we speak about what's going to happen next year today. But we have to make some um, re restoration principles. And those restoration principles have guided us on the way we are redeploying the service. As you all may remember, when COVID hit, our ridership fell on our worst day down to 2.5%. Another way of looking at it is we lost 97.5% of riders. So we actually implemented what we call the snow schedule. It's, it was designed for you know polar vortexes and, and things of that nature. And we put it out at about 50% of our, our normal service level, putting service on all lines, but nowhere near what we had um, you know, in 2019, we've we've put a lot of that schedule back using these principles. And um, one of the unique things that's occurred is those snow days, those polar vortex days, those used to be metro train days. Those days are now work from home days. So we have to continually to listen, evolve, watch, monitor, and make some judgments. We did uh, in 21 uh, kick off with Cook County and Pace, uh, the Fair Transit South Cook pilot program. So a little bit on how that's going with Metro. Next slide, please. And, uh, there was three guiding principles of the program. It took a look at the demographic area of the south suburbs and the south side of Chicago, and it isolated the Rock Island line and the Metro Electric line. The three guiding principles were reducing the fare, reducing the cost of service, that's been done. Um, providing more service levels, that's been done, and then eventually getting to fare integration. The closest we've gotten to fare integration until technology, we're able to catch up and get technology to support this, is this regional connect pass. So I'm very excited once again to continue to push that out. If you're on a fare transit South Cook um, line right now, uh, the reduced fare for a monthly pass is $70. 
So now we're down to $100 unlimited access uh, of the entire transit network. Um, pretty, pretty good deal. Unbelievable compared to what we used to have. Next slide, please. So what did ridership look like on the entire system? Little complicated chart, but here you go. So it starts off in the far uh, left hand side at the beginning of the pandemic when when we were sitting there wondering, you know, what, is it right to be running trains with 14 people on it? And those numbers were, were small. I mean, we were still running a significant amount of trains. So as you go through the pandemic, uh, we did that first green box there called the Commute with Confidence campaign. We saw immediate results of that when we really went after the passengers and said it is safe to be back on transportation. The second green box there was the Safe Return to Work Summit. That's when we partnered with uh, BOMA and uh, the Northwestern Hospital, and we really started talking about getting back in the office. Um, Dave Casper from uh, BMO Harris really came to the table and talked about the value of these in-person meetings. And look, look at the rise that occurred right after that. The next green box there shows when the new schedules went into place. And that's when we put out these new enhanced schedules based on our core principles, more frequent service, memory patterns, and spreading out that rush hour, taking the peak of the peak and making that much wider. That's what we were seeing with the passengers. And then right after that Delta hit, the red box, and then you can see what Omicron did. And once again, for our riders, as we collapsed the farthest from any, any form of public transportation at the beginning of the pandemic, our riders clearly have a different choice that they can make. And so we saw that depression all the way down there in the beginning of the year. So we've actually increased over 200% through the course of this year. And today we average about 145,000 trips a day or roughly 50% of our service. Um, trips. Now, as everybody knows, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays are seem to be more the peaky days. We drop about 15% on Monday and almost 30% on Friday. However, our riders predominantly are from the 10 to 30 mile mark. I came in from Midway this morning, eight miles away, it took an hour to get here. Those roads are packed. So we have a lot of opportunity in front of us with those riders, and we're going to be working very hard with our marketing to really start getting more people to look at Metra and look at the train service again. Once again, carbon footprint, all the things that we're very good at here in transit. But there are people that still believe that in my car, I have more control. We're 95 plus percent on time every day. Um, we're the 18 times safer than any other mode of transportation in the country. We've got to continue to tell our story, as you've heard already. Next slide, please. So the four highlighted lines are the four lines that got the new schedules. And what you can see by these lines is that they actually outperform the other lines. Looking at Metro Electric and Rock Island, the, the nice solid numbers that we have there. And the real interesting thing is the weekend ridership. I chair at AFTA, the uh, commuter rail um, committee, and I also chair the commuter rail coalition. Every single commuter outfit in this country, all 31, report the exact same thing. Very strong ridership on the weekends. So it's not that people are afraid to use the system. They don't know how to use the system. It's just that they're not coming in to go to work on a normal basis. That's why we have to find out where those new discretionary riders are. And we have to work with the business community more than ever. The business community here has a great hand to play. They could talk about transit passes as benefit. They could take a look at rather than saying, here's your parking pass, here's a Metro pass or here's a CTA pass. So I think conversations beyond this room with the business community are very, very important. Next slide, please. Capital program, um, rolling stock is actually being surpassed this year on a one year with stations and parking. And I'm gonna really highlight uh, some of the work we're doing with stations this year. Um, our rolling stock program, I'm gonna get into some of the highlights, but these are the, the, the highlights of the program. So next slide, please. Very, very proud to introduce um, our first SD70 Mack locomotive. It's our first tier three locomotive. This is actually a freight locomotive that was rebuilt. It brings AC truck technology, AC traction motor technology. Um, it's gonna run tier three, so it's the cleanest that we've got out there. And you may or may not recognize those colors. Those colors are, are um, painted in what we call RTA colors. And uh, we did that uh, for the 50 year anniversary RTA, which is coming up. We ordered 15 of these locomotives, but we have options for 27 more. So we're very encouraged that this first one here on property will be out and testing for the next two months on the BNSF. 
and then we'll begin training all the engineers. We'll have, by the end of the year, we believe four on property. So we're looking forward. I'm very much looking forward to see how these things perform, both from a fuel economy standpoint. Um, they've got giant fuel tanks on them. So just keeping them out there for a much more period of time can possibly change our, our operating conditions. And from a reliability standpoint, all modern technology, all proven technology throughout the freight industry. Um, on our electric district, we run AC traction motors. We haven't lost a traction motor in 15 years. From a maintenance cost um, cost maintenance standpoint, this is uh, uh, the direction to go. Next slide, please. So the, the guy on top there, the green one, that's our uh, commitment to actually jumping in and piloting to be the first in the country, a passenger battery powered locomotive. We're going to take our F40, that's the car body you see there, and we've partnered with Progress Rail. We're going to convert three with an option of three more locomotives to 100% battery power. That work's going to be done down in Patterson, Georgia, and we can't wait to actually get it out here and start, as they say, kicking the tires. Uh, meeting with the other commuters, uh, California is so jealous now of Illinois because they're like, how did we not get there first? But Metro is going to be the first in the country that has uh, a battery powered uh, locomotive. And where you don't hang wire, this is the next best option. The other things that we're working on is a battery powered train set. We actually call it a zero emissions train set, but we'll see what the bids come in. Now, we hope to bring that to the board early next year. The idea with this train set, it's going to be something similar to what you may or may not take to an airport. It's the idea of getting regional connection in a way different light, connecting one line to another line to another line. And we're, what I'm very always interested in is really piloting it, not just putting it on a map, drawing it out there, but actually getting it out there. All these logistical contracts that we're going to have to get in place are going to be interesting. But the fact is, we may be able to start connecting communities, O'Hare, McCormick Place, in ways we've never thought before. So the, our goal is to uh, purchase some of these zero emissions train sets. They have to be FRA compliant, which is a challenge because Europe has these. We have different standards here in the U.S. So I've been meeting with manufacturers talking about this, and I'm very excited. Uh, hopefully here in, in early part of next year to take to our board um, a proposal for some zero emissions train sets. The last uh, picture on the corner there is uh, the new car project that we did talk about. There's 500 cars uh, that are in the project. Uh, we did, our board did fund uh, 200 as a base order. It takes a long time to build new rail cars. They did finish the manufacturing facility in New York. And we ex anticipate the first car body starting to come together in about Q1 of next year with delivery of the first prototypes tw at the end of 24. Once again, 200 cars. Um, these cars are going to be way different, way different than the existing cars. That And Chairman, yes, someday we will retire your Eisenhower cars. Next slide, please. <laughs> Um, our rehab programs, this has really been our, our lifeblood forever. When we didn't have funding to buy new cars and get into the locomotive markets and stuff like this, we've been just, and our workforce is incredible, just continually rebuilding. So we rebuild our passenger cars. Um, we're currently working on what we call the Nippon Cheerio cars. Those are a 24, 2004 to 2006 build. Um, the locomotive in the corner, those are 1977s. They're going through their fourth overhaul. They're getting a little cleaner each and every time. They're getting a little more reliable each and every time, but it's still basically a 1977 locomotive. Fuel efficiency isn't there compared to some of the other ones. We also are rebuilding um, some of the Highliner cars that run on the electric district, and we're leasing those actually to South Shore. So we're taking that asset that we didn't need right now based on a, on a lot of different variables on the district, and now we're getting another value out of that. They're paying for the rebuild. They're going to lease it. We've got some clauses in there that if we need them back, we can get them back, but it's going to support their double track and Westlake project there in Indiana. Next slide, please. Bridges, tracks, and structure, there's a ton of work that we constantly have to do. I've pointed out to this board before how many old bridges we have. It's almost 900 bridges. Almost half of those are well over a century old. Uh, we've actually upped our game in inspections. We've, we've really went out in a catalog and, and taken a very deep dive look into the bridges to make sure that we're never running anything unsafe. But there's, there's nowhere near enough funding or time to continue to, to chase this one. We're going to have to start really putting forth a lot more dollars toward that. One of the big projects you're probably all aware of is the 75th Street SIP. 
the quarter improvement project. We were just down there the other day doing a uh, groundbreaking of a flyover where three freight trains or three tracks of freight trains are going to fly over four other tracks. It is the biggest choke point in the nation. These projects are in the hundreds of millions of dollars. More to come on that. But one of the things that we're doing to um, enhance and ac actually receive these trains eventually in another phase is uh, looking at adding a third main line on the Rock Island. Uh, taking a look at the Rock Island service, bringing Southwest service over on another flyover into LaSalle Street. We're going to need another main line. We're going to need yard enhancements, and we're starting all the preliminary engineering and environmental work for that. I know. Uh, President Carter talked about this uh, this money that's out there in the IIJA. We absolutely are at the table. We've got some great projects that are going to be transformational in so many different ways to the region. This is just an example of one of them. Next slide, please. Signal communications technology. You can never you can never um, forget about this. One of the focuses we've had is is our customer experience. Today, if you get on our train and you whip out your credit card to buy a ticket, you will get kicked off because you don't have a fare. Um, we are now moving into the world of providing ticket vending machines. So uh, next slide, please. Our new ticket vending machines, these are going to come in four phases. They're going to take every single fare product, and our goal is to get cash off the trains. So you can buy your ticket, uh, there'll be time stamp. It's incredible technology out there and it's gonna totally change the customer experience with regard to the fair products and how we access the train. Today, 70%, 72% people are using the mobile app. That's very encouraging. But these machines here are gonna take that burden off of the conductor, which just slows down fare collection. 2019, you could have a BNSF train with 1500 people on it takes 28 minutes to come in from Naperville with 1,500 people on it. You got three conductors. Try to try to collect 500 fares in 28 minutes. I mean, so we've set ourselves up in a lot of ways through some success, but also through some economization of these budgets of putting ourselves in a position where, you know, maybe fare loss was something we weren't attacking. So this is going to help us in, in a lot of different ways as an investment for the future. On talking about investment, next slide, please. The Metro Electric has never seen this significant investment like we're about to do. And we have, of our 39 stations that are not ADA accessible, the vast majority of them are in the city of Chicago on the Metro Electric. So we're attacking this very methodically. Every other station um, is on a list right now to be enhanced, uh, to be upgraded, and to be rebuilt, working with the communities, working with uh, I, um, the Rebuild Illinois funds, and all the other players, the historical society, um, anything that's over 50 years old, you have to work with the historical society. There's nothing at Metro that's um, younger than 50 years old. So we, we, we certainly have to uh, work with the state on this. Um, it's, a, it's a big challenge. Uh, I would love to tell you that delivery is a lot faster, but our hope is by the uh, early part of next year, at least three of these stations will be under contract. Um, 59 and 60, that'll tie to the new Obama Center. Millennium and South Water, that's, that's some work that has to be done. And, and some of the work that's already ongoing, I, I'd like to point out now. Next slide, please. You're gonna have to hit this uh, a couple different times, but here we have Ravenswood, Peterson Ridge, uh, uh, both on the UP North, uh, Grayland um, on the Milwaukee line, Auburn Park is getting going now at 147th Street of Metro Electric's under construction, and we just awarded a contract for Homewood. In the next, year or so we should have 13 different stations on metro electric either almost fully designed or under construction it's going to be an immense um opportunity for us to totally change the way people use that service on that south side next slide please this just lists a lot of the other projects um, from some of the other lines bnsf milwaukee north rock island um, several there and a couple on the up north line as well these these range from just upgrading the station to bringing them into full ADA compliance. And next slide, please. We talked about the customer experience. Everything we're doing with regard to the customer is really got to be about doing better. So you've been to other cities, you've been and go to a CTA stop. It says what the next train comes in seven minutes here. You have to figure that out. You have to go to a, a map. You have to go look at a chart. You have to look at your watch. 
But we've got now signage that's coming just like that, um, developed in-house. We're going to start putting everywhere. Um, it's that, that, that intuitive signage that customers want and need. Just show me what I need to know. Tell me what's, what's going on. Um, be better with our information. We're working on bicycle parking, parking lot improvements, ADA improvements, and uh, we're really concentrating a little bit on the, the shelters. Uh, we don't have a lot of stations out there with really decent shelters. We have 242 stations active today and we're building two more. So we'll, we'll have 244 active stations. The vast majority of those, if it's raining or inclement out, have very little shelter. So that's one of our core goals. It's not about when you're getting off the train. We all know where you're going then. You're either getting your car, you're walking, your Uber, or your pace bus. Um, but really, it's about waiting for that train. And once in a while, the train isn't there on time. We need to provide a better environment for people to wait for the train. So that concludes my report today. Next slide. Um, I'm looking forward to any questions this board may have. Thank you very much, Jim. Questions? Director Colson? Yeah, let me ask you about a, a subject that's near and dear to the people up in my area, and that's the three Union Pacific lines um, and the threats to the three Union Pacific lines. Can you tell us how much money does Metro pay UP to provide these services, and what is this, the stat? Uh, what is the status of discussions I know that are going with uh, UP? What is the future of those three lines? So I'll start with the status and I'll go to what, what this costs. Um, status is in 2019, we approached UP and their UP approached us and we thought it was mutually a great idea that those UP employees that know how to operate those three lines, maintain those three lines, become Metro employees. We, we felt better for our customers, better for the, the quality of the product that's out there. Um, and so the, the conversation began, 2019. And one of the core concepts that I worked out with uh, Lance Fritz, their chairman, was it needs to be cost neutral. Uh, it shouldn't cost the taxpayers of Illinois any more money to operate the system than it does today. So in 2021, or I, I'll go back to a full, full funding, 2019 last year, it was 225 million. And that includes the fringe, the, uh, the, the trackage fees, the fuel, and all the other ancillary things that go under a purchase of service agreement. So we're in negotiations. Like a lot of things in negotiations, the number one driver is usually money. So that's, that's where we're at. Uh, we still believe um, that the, the employees themselves are gonna be the best employees for Metra. We've began the discussions with the non-contract employees, and we actually are targeting to bring some non-contract employees over as early as January. We've picked up over the last couple of years a few of the, the work that they do over there. We've done some of the, uh, the risk. We've taken on the risk. We've taken on some of the accounting, some of the, some of the, the ancillary things that we were paying for, and now we pay for them in-house. Um, but the big nut there is, is the unionized workforce. And so we haven't really begun those discussions, um, but we have a full intent like mid-year mid next year to really be in, in depth in that. As you all know, or may know, uh, there's a potential national freight um, strike that could happen here. And all of those employees fall under those that, that agreement right now. So there is a little bit of uh, Metro's conversations not as important to them at this time, but we continue to work with Union Pacific on the management side. It is really the, the access fee and the trackage fees that we are in negotiations on. Union Pacific has given me very clear commitments numerous times that they are not gonna walk away from those lines. Dr. Canty. Hi. Good to good to see you again. Um, I I appreciate some of the things that you said about the directional signs and making that a little bit easier. Is there room to improve some communications on the app? Right. So I can speak from our experience in Arlington Heights on the UP Northwest, which you know we've had some real challenges there. Um, there's there's numbers for the tracks, but there's nothing that tells you which train is coming on which number. The app doesn't tell you which train is coming on which number. The app also doesn't timely update when trains are running late. You get an email which comes much later than intended, right? So is there, are there efforts underway to improve some of that? Yeah, so first and foremost, Metro doesn't own the apps. CTA does. 
Um, and yes, we've been able, and I believe it's coming out very soon, uh, GTFS feeds, which is the real-time feeds are going to the app, and now service delivery is going to go right to the app. It's going to be a, a way to do train tracking like you've never done before. Okay. And then with some of the challenges with delays in the trains, right? So my office is directly across the street from the train station, and I'm watching people run back and forth trying to predict which train is going to get there first and how they can jump on it. Um, and we know there were a couple accidents recently. Is that a staffing issue? Like what's, what's being done there to try and improve that so that people aren't feeling so harried and making dangerous choices? Yeah, I, I mean, from a scheduling standpoint, that should not happen, right? Uh, so obviously something's happened out there that causes the schedule to be slightly off. Um, once again, I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's, a, it's about communication. It is about which track. You know, they are so blessed in that area to have three tracks. Uh, anywhere we have three tracks, the, the amount of capacity that we can run is just incredible. Um, and, but the big challenge there is you've got that middle track. And that middle track really is, I'll just say, the, the, the much more challenging one to make sure you can get to. So um, we do try to work with our GPS center and do an, a station announcements and making sure that those are working on a normal basis. But I think, to your point, if it's going to the app, if most people are using the app, um, that's just another uh, communications feed that probably needs to be enhanced. Okay. Thank you. Director Andalcio. What an awesome presentation, and, and, and more importantly, um, thank you so much for uh, the attention on DEI. In fact, uh, Mr. Casper from BMO Harris was the main sponsor for Chicago United's uh, Diversity and Equity Inclusion Award. Um, so I think you guys are doing a great job. I know uh, Ms. Thomas there uh, runs that DB department used to, but with her watch, I know that you will be increasing those goals especially in hiring, but more importantly, on the contract uh, procurement opportunities. Um, I noticed a little bit of dip in the percentages, rightfully so, due to the pandemic. Um, is it your intention now to increase those outreach uh, and working with assist agencies such as HACIA, AHCC, and others? Um, good morning. Yes, yes. thank you. Mm -hmm. um, last year, even in COVID, I believe I counted, we did uh, 17 uh, virtual outreach events. And in the year, there will be four more. Uh, one of the uh, exciting things we just did was a recording, a webcast of uh, the DB certification so that vendors can actually just log on and walk through it. Uh, we are partnering with Harcia. We did uh, do an event um, recently and we're going to do um, some more. One of the things I challenged uh, Harcia to do was to reach out and make sure Metro became a permanent part of their training agenda. So we're waiting on that invitation. Uh, our goal and our commitment is to make sure that we always have goals that are realistic and achievable on our contracts. It does no good to have a goal just to say you have a goal when a, a firm, and you know this better than I do, cannot, cannot actually perform. They cannot actually have an opportunity to do the work that they are certified for. So we will continue to expand. We will continue to try to grow our DBE program by helping vendors understand that we can walk them through it for free. Uh, not knocking anyone that's in the business of helping folks cert getting certified, but most of the time they do it wrong because they're not the subject matter expert. So why pay when you can actually get that assistance from Metro staff that will sit down and walk you through the application process? So a uh, long answer is yes. Uh, and I kind of heard you know pressure about increasing the percentage, uh, but uh, we are very proud of our 49 million DB participation that represented an increase over the 37 million participation from 2021. So even in COVID, we still figured out a way to keep the small businesses moving and keep projects moving. So we hope to be ramping that up more. Well, I know with your passion over that program, there's been a lot of successful minority-owned companies. Um, I want to commend you, especially in this time of world of the stress and the pandemic, that you continue to be transformational, innovative, and ingenuity. Uh, I think this is absolutely great that you did not get off of that thinking method and looking at those uh, uh, fully battery operated trains. I think that's a great way for the environment. So thank you for all you do. You guys do an awesome job. Uh, your management team is excellent and you know how to run a train system. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Sager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to ask your forgiveness and indulgence as well as that of uh, my colleagues here, too. 
I want to echo um, Director Andalcio's comments. Uh, Jim, it was an excellent, excellent presentation this morning, uh, and not the least of uh, which is the reason that you you identified Woodstock in your comments at least twice. So I'm grateful for that. <laughs> um, I, I want to certainly commend you, uh, your administrative staff, and and your board for the, your incredibly strong and responsible fiscal management and fiscal stewardship. I think you all have done historically a, a significant job of accomplishing that for which we are very, very grateful. I also want to thank you and commend you for your critical review uh, resulting in flexibility and responsiveness with scheduling shifts and um, all of the uh, adjustments that were necessary during the pandemic. I also believe that you've done a superb communication relative to, to all agencies regarding uh, efforts of communication uh, with communities as well as riders um, about your services, your schedules, uh, your fee schedules, and certainly sanitation. So I, I just think you all have done a yeoman's job in, in communication and have taken every possible avenue that you could get the word out. So I'm grateful for that. I also believe your focus um, on visioning and planning leading to local facilities improvement, expansion of, of uh, facilities and opportunities in your creative and innovative services uh, has been just exceptional. So I want to commend you on that. And finally, I think that you have uh, done just a yeoman's job of outreach and collaboration uh, with local communities. So I applaud you in all of those efforts. One of the questions I have is with regards to the significant gap that we all know exists relative to budgets of the future and the capital needs. I mean, it's just e extensive, and I think that we have to recognize and appreciate that. And as we go into uh, the next several years, that's going to be paramount, and we have to be able to address that. The board of the uh, Metro has historically been very conservative regarding bond extensions. Uh, as you look to the future and the need to try to cover the gap and simultaneously uh, do all the innovative work that you're looking for, uh, what do you believe is the tenor of the board and you all as a staff regarding uh, extending some bonds to accommodate that uh, gap? I'll kind of reflect back on uh, President Carter's comments. There is uh, so much significant money out there in Washington right now that the opportunity in front of us is something we have to very much take seriously. The angle, of course, is you have to have local match. And so, as you can see by all of our projects, and I could just I could throw all that money in the bridges and I still don't even dent the, uh, the problem. Um, so we definitely are communicating with the board, um, possibly, looking at debt service for the first time in Metro's history and, and utilizing potentially that to either reallocate some of the programs in the, in the capital program and or uh, come up with the local match for some of these um, potentially incredible opportunities coming out of Washington over the next four years. I'm certainly uh, biased. I say that unabashedly. I know that we have responsibility for all transit services and I'm Grateful for the opportunity to represent all, but I uh, have a bit of a bias uh, because Metro is the primary transit service of McHenry County. So I do appreciate everything that you all are doing and uh, look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Dr. Seiger, after the movie Groundhog Day, we all mentioned Woodstock over <laughs> and over and over again every day. Every Until morning. you get it right, uh. correct. <laughs> <laughs> Director Groven. So I'll be a bit repetitive. Thanks again for the excellent presentation. Uh, thanks for the incredible response over the last couple of years, entire team. Um, I want to maybe stay on this theme around capital and, and infrastructure. I think it's fantastic. You've got, you've amped up your uh, inspection of the bridges. Uh, what can you tell us more about what you're seeing from that? Is there is there, are we getting maybe more confidence that the structural integrity is there? It, it, do we see that there's a cliff coming and we're going to need to, you know? Do we potentially have a longer runway, or are we finding that that there's a potential cliff and these bridges are going to need immediate response? So first and foremost, the, the good news is everything's safe. Um, so the reason we did this is so that now we can more formally document um, in, in a much more methodic way any progression of deterioration. Before it was, uh, let's just say the bridge rating is one to five, the bridge is a three. 
you know, 10 years ago, that was subjective to who, you know, so now what we've done is actually gone out, photographed, droned, a lot of different things. So to, to answer your question, to see if there's progression and deterioration, then we'll, we'll monitor that. But we also have a program now of just enhancements, um, places where, you know, there's concrete work that can be done that, that extends, you know, the, the useful life of the bridge. Um, that's, that's being programmed. So it's not necessarily the full complete bridge replacement, but we've put more money into making sure that a robust bridge program is going to be there for us for a long time because there's not enough money, there's not enough time for bridge replacement. So the, the, to answer your question, I think is with what we have right now as a baseline, uh, I'm very confident that we're running very safe. Um, it's hard to tell if you look at any amount of deterioration, how long it's been there based on the previous way we did record keeping. Okay, thank you. Um, I think it's a fantastic approach given the limitations we have on the funding and uh, you know, keep us in a safe place. So thank you. Dr. Gorman. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Jim and <clears throat> Metro team for the fine presentation and um, and and being here. Um, just a couple questions. I'm just curious what and maybe I missed this. What percentage of riders are back on Metro, you know, from pre COVID? So we're averaging about 43 percent today or yesterday was 53 percent. Um, we've seen lines spike as high as 65 percent. Weekend ridership, like I've pointed out, sometimes is in the 80s and over 100. Um, but on a system average, we're at about 43% right now if you take an aggregate out all days of the week. And our budget right now suggests that we start the year at 40 and end the year at 55. Okay. Thank you. And then um, there's a mention of the 72% of the riders are using the, um, the app uh, to pay. What about the other 28%? Is that being collected by the conductors or? Conductors or ticket agents. Okay. And then... Um, I was going to advocate for the Southwest line, but numbers don't lie. I saw that that was <clears throat> probably the most underutilized line, you know, at 27 percent. Um, and then you'd mentioned about redirecting the Southwest line. Can you expound on that or? Yeah. Um, so under the create program, which was uh, formed about 19 years ago, it there was a direction from the STB to untangle the rail network here in Chicago. One of the biggest, largest most expensive projects uh, has been called the 75th Street SIP. It's a it's four different major projects. Um, one of those is called P2. P2 is a passenger project, and it's literally going to build a bridge from 74th Street on the Southwest Service and fly over and connect to the Rock Island at 74th Street. 74th and it's 74th and I'm a grid girl. On, on the uh, um, on which line? And well, the southwest where that flyover is, it's 74th and I, I, I'm not, I'm, like, I think it's about maybe a half mile east of Western. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. That makes sense. So the southwest service um, is one of the lines that we've struggled with with regard to honestly the, uh, the manpower and then there's contractual issues. So I'm very proud to announce that hopefully next week you'll be seeing some announcements out there where we're putting out enhanced schedules, Southwest Service, Milwaukee North, Milwaukee West, and UP West. So we've been working very hard and very diligently with our partners and those results that we saw um, with the BNSF, the Rock Island, the UP North, and the Metro Electric with an enhanced schedule, we certainly hope in the first quarter of next year to start seeing the fruits of that labor with regard to ridership. Because right now on Southwest, there's just not a lot of trains. Yep. North Central Service, there's just not a lot of trains. So yep. we're, we're getting to the point now where the manpower is up, the, the agreements are being finalized with the freight railroads, and we believe we can start adding service back. And it'll be a little bit unique and different than it was before, just like we use our service restoration principles. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Great. Director Carey. First of all, I want to thank you for your very comprehensive uh, introduction to the budget. Um, I had two questions. One, there was a significant increase in admin expenses. Could you tell me what's built into that from, from 22 estimated expenses to 23 budget? You want to... Part of that is claims. Part of that is uh, headcount increases for project management, which we use for our capital program. Okay, so yeah. claims and headcount for. Well, and I would just add that, you know, we have been, I think, has been mentioned, 
um, very careful with our spending. So um, we're running favorable in 2022 versus our 2022 budget um, in spending. And a lot of that is in the admin area where we have the ability to delay or accelerate and in this case delay certain studies and other projects and other spending that we are putting back into the budget for 2023. So some of it is just a, um, you know, putting some of that those dollars back. Headcount is another item. Um, we are, when I say headcount, we just like the other service boards, we are running below budget in terms of filled positions. Mm -hmm. Our budget for 2023 assumes that those positions get filled. Okay, and that probably leads into um, my second question, which is how you're ramping up to handle. Um, you talk about the opportunity for to get capital dollars right now, and uh, and there's the 130 million dollars that RTA could bond in uh, 2023 for Metra. Um, so how are you ramping up to be able to handle the number of capital projects that will be on your plate? Yeah, I think that's uh, really where, where Janice comes into play here. Um, we've built this incredible team we call Project Delivery. Um, it's taken about two years to get off. It is just growing, understanding the needs. It's, I mean, because everything is, is, is important when you go for a federal application. You can't just say, I've got a great project. You have to do the preliminary engineering. You have to do the environmental. You have to be significantly understanding the price point. So all of these now are moving forward um, on, on a gamut of lists. Janice has a whole spreadsheet here of just projects. But what you're seeing in the admin side and also inside her team is the fact that forever in a day, Metra sat back and got our formula money. Very grateful for that. But we didn't have you know, giant sums of capital dollars. It wasn't until Rebuild Illinois came along that we had to ramp our staff up to start meeting those needs. And that's why we had to bring on project management oversight as well to bring in industry best practices so that we can kind of really shore up um, how we can start delivering in these these programs, such as the same as President Carter said, don't don't judge us now, judge us in a couple of years because you're going to really see this accelerate. And um, if I could just add to that, this is a list, you can't read it and I won't read them all, but this is just some of, to the tune of almost $800 million in projects for 2023. So before I left the office, I asked for a list of the projects that we were actively engaging and moving forward in 2023. So just to give you some categories, we're talking about a civil structure, a mechanical signal station and parking. As you saw, Jim said there was an uptick for the first time and I'm proud about it. The station and parking is actually taking lead over the trains, locomotives, that's a little dig at Jim, but um, <laughs> excited about that. And how are we going to do that? When we brought in our PMO, we realized that we needed to help with moving projects along. We needed help improving and being more efficient and effective in how we delivered the projects, particularly in how we defined the scope, how we actually did an estimate, how we make sure we were staying in, in budget and we were delivering what we said we were going to deliver when we said we were going to do it, how we have an effective cost project management system, looking at the part that really uh, hurts and harms small and large businesses, how we pay. So we're going through a process of looking at our payment process, looking at having a dashboard for a pencil copy, you know, so communicating, being upfront. And then the other thing that we're doing, it has become a passion of Jim's and uh, because it's a passion of his, it becomes one of mine, is how do we aggressively go after the discretionary funds? So our planning, our grants, our PMO, our capital delivery team, they meet with our lobbyists to make sure that we're not missing those opportunities. And what we learn is you have to be ready when the opportunity knocks. So in order to do that, we have to go through all of these steps, properly identify the projects. We have to have the matching funds. So Jim is going to lift that load and work with the board to make sure we have what we need as we work very hard and aggressively to deliver these projects. And this is just the list of the ones that we had in the midst of going into COVID. And as we're coming out of COVID, it does not even begin to uh, totally qualify or quantify all the additional mm -hmm. projects that we need to do. So I'll join what President Carter said. We'll take it. Don't look at us now, judge us in the future because we're moving in the right direction, I believe, for the first time in a long, long time. Okay, e excellent uh, answer. Thank you very much. Um, looks like you're gearing up for it or are geared up. Uh, and the last thing I just want to say is your, um, I think it called it the system restoration initiative. Um, very impressive. Um, you are, as we've talked with all the service bureaus, you need to change the way you run today and the services you provide. And it sounds like you're doing that iter iteratively and kind of 
as you find some, you know, what needs to be changed, you need an express, you need fewer trains, more trains, whatever. So I congratulate you on that. Thank, Thank you. you. Director Holt. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, just uh, wanted to follow up on the uh, assumptions you all have made. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about the assumptions around ridership growth. You know, I look not just at next year, but at the projections for the out years. They appear to be fairly aggressive given what appears to be a permanent change in commuter patterns, as well as, you know, you noted yourself that the Metro certainly has a ridership that has flexibility and other options available to it. So could you all, could you talk a little bit more about that and how you've come to those numbers and the assumptions you've made behind the ridership growth? Yeah, I, I think um, it comes right down to taking a look at the history, right? So as I showed you, uh, you know, the 200% growth just this year alone, and that was based on only four of our lines getting enhanced schedules. Now we're going to go to eight lines with enhanced schedules, and we're going to kind of see. The one thing that we've never had before that we have now is onboard surveys. So we're talking to the passengers all the time. We're figuring out through the electronic data that we've never had. How many days a week are you riding? I don't know who you are. I, I know who your phone is, um, but I know now more data than I've ever known before. And we're starting to see the nuances that are kind of indicating that this return of the office is going to be a little stronger. Now, when you talk about how where we're at today at 43 percent or even spiking up to 63 percent, the point is, how can you have a 20 percent swing in just one day? And so we have to take in, kind of cut it in half and say, well, we're not going to be totally crazy and say we're getting back to 100%. Matter of fact, I tell people all the time now, there is no 100%. We need to stop talking about pre-COVID ridership. We can talk about pre-COVID budget, but we can't talk about pre-COVID ridership because the riders are different. I would suggest to you today that I'm very, very close to the same amount of unique riders that I had in 2019. And their ridership pattern has changed because of what they're doing, because of what their employers are doing. Once again, here's my plug, go talk to the uh, business owners down here and get them to bring people back in the office. But we're seeing this all over the country. I just got back from California this, uh, this morning and um, if you think we have a problem, Oakland, San Francisco, Seattle, uh, they're in the, we're riding eight car trains out there. There's eight of us on the train. It, it is a, to you walk around out there and it's not like as vibrant as Chicago is where you can at least see restaurants are opening up. It's a totally different mindset. And talking with my commuter partners across the country, New York's the other end. So it's kind of interesting that we're in the middle. Uh, and I think we're just slower to recover than New York, way faster to cover than the West Coast, which has really uh, went into this. So I hopefully answered your questions. Like we kind of took a shot in the middle of where the highs and the lows are. And then we took a look at the growth this year, knock on wood, there's no, you know, another COVID uh, disruption, uh, the trajectory right now that we're seeing, we believe is actually very conservative over the course of the next year. And then actually even the slower growth over the other years, those are gonna be the harder riders to get. My best marketing is my riders talking to their neighbors about getting out of their cars. Cause we know, we absolutely know from all our surveys, the number one reason people drive a ride Metro, reduction of stress, it's not value. Any other questions or comments? I will just uh, echo what I said when President Carter was up there. Um, Jim's the head of the commuter rail committee of uh, our national uh, association. And again, I think, uh, you know, it speaks volumes of how he's viewed nationally. Uh, nobody runs a better commuter rail system than Chicago, and ours is probably the most complex as well, and it's the best run. So um, thank you, Janice. Thank you so much for everything you do. She is, uh, she's, she's, she's amazing when you have her in negotiations. So, And welcome, new Mr. CFO. So it, uh, it'll be great. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Now our own small RTA budget. Bill Ackman, thank you. <laughs> I'll do that again. Good morning, Chairman Dillard, members of the board. Uh, this is interim CFO Bill Ackman. 
I'm going to present a brief overview of the proposed 2023 RTA agency budget. But first, before I begin, I'd like to thank the RTA budget staff, particularly Nora Buya and Sarah Rubino, who worked with the RTA managers to draft a budget within our funding level that supports the needs of the agency. Next slide, please. As you might expect, the proposed budget will focus on the implementation of the RTA strategic plan that you will consider for adoption in February. In 2023, budgeted funding and revenues total $36.9 million, as shown on the left in the slide. Of that amount, 98%, 98% or $36.3 million represent regional public funding from the RTA sales tax. As shown on the right, the budgeted agency expenses also total $36.9 million. This amount is $9.4 million lower than the 2022 budget because the 2023 budget includes no federal grants for 5310 projects. Don't worry, a call for these projects is conducted in alternate years. The RTA agency accounts for only 1% of the 2023 regional expense budget. Administrative costs account for 47.9% or $17.7 million of agency expenses. This amount is 45% below the 2023 statutory administrative cap of $32 million allowed by the RTA Act. The regional programs budget accounts for the remaining 52.1% or $19.2 million of agency expenses. Regional programs include services that the RTA provides directly to the public at 47% or $17.3 million as well as grant and RTA funded projects at 5.1% or $1.9 million. Next slide, please. This chart depicts the portion of the 2023 proposed RTA agency budget supported by regional funding from the RTA sales tax. The 2023 administrative budget is 1.3% higher than the 2022 adopted budget. This is due mostly to higher personnel and IT related expenses. The 2023 regional programs budget increases by approximately 4.7% due mostly to RTA COVID recovery initiatives, such as the strategic plan implementation, as well as new community planning projects and increased expenses for the ADA paratransit certification program and travel training. Total agency headcount is budgeted, is budgeted at 110 positions. This is one more than in the 2022 budget, but still three positions fewer than the pre-COVID 2019 budgeted headcount of 113 people. In summary, total funding for the RTA 2023 agency budget increases from the 2022 adopted budget by just 3% or less than $1.1 million to $36.3 million. This amount accounts for less than 2% of total 2023 regional funding for transit operations. Next slide, please. In 2021, the RTA exceeded its DBE participation goal of 16% for federally funded contracts by a full 10 percentage points. RTA's efforts to grow the agency's DBE and SBE, or small business, programs continued despite the COVID-19 pandemic. The RTA participated in virtual government procurement compliance forums and pre-bid meetings. Then, as COVID-19 cases subsided, in-person networking events resumed. The RTA attended multiple outreach events and had the opportunity to network with network with and support small and minority owned businesses. That concludes my very brief presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions or comments on our own budget? Director Ross. I believe this question is redundant because I think it was asked before, but if we were able to exceed our goal by 10%, does that mean our goal is too low? Certainly means our goal should be higher. Yes.
All right, thank you, Mel. Let's move on to item 6B, which is the presentation of the quarterly performance report uh, for the third quarter of 2022. And Peter, you're hanging in there. Uh, come on up. Well, now I guess, good afternoon, <laughs> uh, Chair Chairman, members of the board. Again, I'm Peter Farnwell, Manager of Strategic Planning, and um, I'm here to present our year-to-year -year date performance uh, results through the third quarter of 2022 in comparison to 2021. Next slide, please. So I, and, and until adoption of the next strategic plan, we continue to use the three goals from invest in transit to structure our quarterly reports. And I'll discuss performance within the context of each goal. Um, within this presentation, we make a comparisons to 2021. So although 2021 began with uh, severe COVID restrictions, recall that vaccinations were widely available by the third quarter. Illinois had lifted the, the mask mandates and schools are generally back in full pers in person learning. Next slide, please. So our first strategic goal is deliver value on our investment and focuses on two key questions. Do we get more funding and are we efficient stewards of the funds that we have? Next slide. And for this goal, we monitor progress by tracking capital and operating funding and expenditures and looking at the annual results of capital funding decreased by $442 million from last year. And as I mentioned in previously quarterly presentations, this is largely uh, the year over year decrease stems from the granting of all the remaining rebuild Illinois bond funds in the first quarter of 2021. The year to date capital expenditures of nearly $923 million was a 16% increase from 2021, a difference of $129 million. And ex expenditures, are, expenditures are increasing as the service boards move from design to construction on important projects that are funded with the rebuild Illinois bonds and the PAYGO funds. Uh, the system-wide inflation-adjusted operating costs per passenger trip of $9.56 was about one-fourth lower compared to 2021, and it was below $10 for the first time since the pandemic began. And the fare revenue per passenger trip of $1.54 was $0.07 cents higher compared to 21. And both of these figures are significant improvements that stem directly from increased ridership. Next slide. So the first spotlight for the first goal, um, we wanted to show how the capital program has been talked about today is increased based on the infusion of federal dollars from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act or the IIGA. Uh, the lower black bar shows the chart represents the annual funding of capital funds prior to the addition of the IIGA funds. And the orange part on top shows the additional funds made available with the IIGA allotment. So with the IIJ funding over the five-year 2023 to 2027 capital program, uh, total capital funding will increase between 200 and 225 million dollars per year, which results in about uh, 1.1 billion dollars in additional to the capital program over the five-year period. And additional funding is, is allowing several key projects of uh, we talked about today: the CTA's significant advancement in electrification, uh, metrics. Uh, focus on maintaining and replacing the aging fleet and uh, pace work is also on electrification the north division garage and the uh, program southwest garage next slide and moving on the second goal in, is uh, build on the strengths of our network where we ask questions did the region become more transit friendly and are we focusing our limited resources wisely next slide Next slide, please. And for this call, we have been reporting the vehicle revenue miles, which is the total miles that the buses and rail cars travel in revenue service as it reflects the amount of service supplied to our readers, to our riders. And the bars show that the total vehicle miles for each year and the year-over-year -year percentage change is noted above the each bar for the last 10 years. And through the third quarter of 2022, the vehicle revenue miles was 1.8% lower compared to 2021. And over the 10 year time period reflected here, down 15% um, or about 26.5 million miles. Uh, while CTA service is down over 8% from 2021 due to ongoing staffing issues, Metro, on the other hand, has increased service 21%. Next slide. 
And the spotlight here, um, uh, Ms. Thomas, uh, Metro talked about uh, this, uh, so I'll just kind of fill in some details, um, kind of response also to Director Lewis's uh, inquiry last last month, which we thank to thank him for. And we got some information from the Cook from the uh, Cook County Department of Transportation and Highways um, on the Cook County Fair Transit pilot. Um, as mentioned, uh, between the Metro Electric and Rock Island, uh, with the fifty percent, nearly fifty percent reduction in the, in the ticket costs. Um, then it also involved an increase in the service on the 352 Halstead bus by pace. Um, the, um, the the ridership um, is, is a little hard to analyze given the pandemic, uh, you know, direct drastic impact on, of the pandemic. But uh, what the county and Metro have looked at is the uh, recovery of the two Metro Electric and Rock Island lines in comparison to the system, total Metro system. Uh, you can see in the lower met the lower line in, the, in light green is um, the metro system, and the darker line on top is the recovery of the metro electric and Rock Island lines. And you can see that uh, those two lines are recovering at a faster rate than the system, indicating that there is some success to the pilot. Um, they, they've also the county has also been doing um, surveys. Uh, they've done um, they're planning four surveys, and the third of which is about to be launched this month. And from the prior two surveys, surveys they found that 61% um, uh, of the transit experience is greatly or somewhat improved due to the pilot. Uh, about half of those who ride the Metro Electric or Rock Island have reported taking the service more due to the lower fares since the pilot began. Uh, many stating that they would have driven for those trips were it not for the pilot. And available ridership uh, data suggests that neighborhoods experiencing low income are benefiting from the most from the fare reductions on the Metro Electric. Um, the expansion of the Pace Route 352 service is is making the service more convenient um, for riders experiencing low incomes, but it has not shown the same increase in ridership. So the partners are exploring options for what comes after the pilot period and how best to improve affordability and expand the options for transit riders in South Cook. As many riders have reported that affordability is the most important char characteristic of that service. Next slide. And a third goal is stay competitive, where we ask, are we providing the kind of services that people want to ride? And are people satisfied with it when they do? And next slide. And for this goal, we track ridership as well as metrics related to speed and reliability. Um, as we talked about, system wide ridership through the third quarter of this year was 210 million, um, 50.8 million higher compared to 2021, an increase of 31.8%. The system wide average speed was 15.0 miles per hour, 2.2% higher than last year. Um, on time performance was 81.9% for CTA bus, up 2.4 percentage points, and 53.7% for CTA rail, a decrease of 4.7 percentage points. Uh, Metro reported higher on-time performance in 2022 by 0 0.2 percentage points, but ex in exceeding its target of 95%. Uh, the pace bus on-time performance was not available at this time. Next slide. So uh, for our third spotlight, uh, I wanted to give you an update on the return to work expectations that we've gleaned from our latest uh, customer panel surveys, which we conducted in October. And for the fourth time, we've reached out to our customer survey panel to ask about their recent use of transit, about their feelings and expectations regarding the future use of transit. So the chart shows the panelists' responses to the question, when do you expect to be riding transit regularly? And the black line at the top shows responses from our first summer 2021 survey was clearly more optimistic with over 86% of the respondents expecting to return to transit by the year end 2023. Uh, the orange and gray lines show responses for the next two iterations of the survey and closely aligned to each other. Uh, the most current iteration of the survey shown by the brown line shows that 80% of the respondents expect to return to the pre-pandemic ridership by year end 2023. And when we compare it to prior surveys, um, the, the latest survey respondents are writing less today than they had predicted and a little bit less optimistic about their future use. Next slide. Yeah. Th these are uh, individual writers. Uh, I think it's about a thousand people that we ask. Yeah. 
Uh, in summary, uh, the capital expenditures have seen a significant increase over 2021. Um, the Fair Transit Project um, has resulted in above average ridership increases on the Metro Electric in Rock Island. And our customer panels are telling us that it's realistic to assume the ridership will not fully return to pre-pandemic levels. And that concludes my presentation and appreciate your attention and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Peter. Any questions or comments? Thank you very Thank much. You. Let's move on to item 7A, uh, chair of the resolution certifying financial results for the third quarter. And Doug Anderson is making his way up. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. This is Doug Anderson, manager of operating budgets and analysis here at the RTA. Today, I'll be asking you to certify the service board's financial results through the third quarter against the 2022 operating budgets adopted in May. I'll then briefly cover our focus topic of the month, budget adoption criteria. First, let's look at our primary metric for evaluating substantial accordance with budget, operating deficit performance. Next slide, please. The operating deficit results through September were favorable to budget for each service board and the region as a whole. Each service board's operating expenses were significantly lower than budgeted, and CTA, Metra, and PACE system-generated revenues were each above budget. ADA paratransit revenue was under budget due to lower reimbursements for RTA certification trips, but ADA paratransit expense performance more than offset that revenue shortfall. Accordingly, staff recommends a finding of insubstantial accordance with budget for each service board and the region as a whole. Next slide, please. Our other routine update is the status of federal relief funding. The service boards drew in excess of $23 million since our last update, and as a region, we have now drawn about 43% of the $3.5 billion total. As we heard from the service board teams earlier, relief funding is now projected to last into the third quarter of 2025 for Metra and through the 2025 budget year for CTA and PACE. Upon exhaustion of the existing federal relief funding, the regional operating budget is expected to face a budget gap in excess of $700 million for fiscal year 2026, if transit service levels are to be maintained. Ridership at that time is expected to have recovered to around 70% of pre-pandemic levels, and new funding sources will be needed to compensate for the resulting lower level of system-generated fare revenue. Next slide, please. Now turning to our focus topic for this month, the RTA Act criteria which must be met for the adoption of the service board and regional operating budgets. Those seven criteria are listed here. Some are more straightforward than others. For example, staff can and does verify the more technical criteria, such as recovery ratios, number three, and conformance to adopted funding levels, number six. Others, particularly four and five, regarding reasonable assumptions and sound financial practices are analyzed by staff, but ultimately left to the judgment of the board. Regardless, all of the budget materials we prepare, as well as the service board presentations you heard today, are designed to assist the board with the evaluation of each of these criteria. Perhaps the most important criteria is also the first on the list, balanced budget. This simply means that anticipated revenues are equal to anticipated expenses. In the budget materials, you'll see the difference between revenue and expenses referred to as net result, which in the private sector might be called surplus deficit or profit and loss. The net result in the proposed 2023 service board and regional budgets and 10 year plan, uh, two year plans is zero, indicating that balance has been achieved given the many assumptions which have been made. Next slide, please. In closing, we have now checked off each of the major terms, including net result, that we use for evaluating the service board financial results and budgets. We will continue to present topics we think may be of interest, and if the board has anything in particular they would like us to focus on at future meetings, please let us know. That concludes my presentation. Back to you, Mr. Chairman, for any questions the board may have with a reminder that the proposed third quarter resolutions do require a vote. Thank you, Doug. Any questions? But a motion and a second to approve. Uh, Director Holt moves we um, approve and uh, second by Director Groven. Uh, is there, I think we could do leave for the attendance roll call, can we not, Jeremy? Uh, is there leave for the attendance roll call? Um, 
Hearing no objections, leave is granted and 7A is approved. Thanks, Doug. Um, next, uh, I think we can address the following agenda items at the same time as they appear on the board agenda. Uh, and the items for consideration include item 7B, an ordinance approving a contract for RTAM's website hosting enhancements and GIS support. Uh, if there are questions, um, Jill, uh, Jill Leary is here to, to answer them. Uh, item 7C is an ordinance authorizing a contract for operations of the Travel um, Information Center. And uh, Michael Vander Creek is here if there's questions uh, on that. Um, 7C is, uh, or 7D is a resolution setting the 2023 RTA meeting schedule. Um, Jeremy can um, answer any questions on it. And 7E is approval of travel uh, expense reimbursements. Any questions on these? If not, I think we can take them all together. Uh, Director Andalcio moves that we uh, approve, seconded by uh, uh, Director uh, Cotel. With that, uh, is there leave for the attendance roll call? Seeing no objection, um, leave is granted, and those are uh, approved, Mr. Secretary. Um, item eight, new business. Any new business to come before the uh, RTA uh, this morning? Um, if not, I thank you all for your perseverance in this very important meeting. Our next meeting will be held on December 15th at uh, 9 a.m. I want to please make sure that you all note that the RTA will be holding a public hearing on uh, Wednesday, December 7th from 4 to 6 p.m. on Zoom for public comment on the proposed 2023 regional transit uh, operating budget, the 2023 to 2027 capital program and regional strategic um, draft that we will have. Um, information can be found on our new and improved um, RTA website. So if there's no further business to come before the uh, RTA Board of Directors this morning, um, how about a motion to adjourn in a second? Uh, there's a motion by Director Fuentes that we adjourn, seconded by uh, Director um, Gaving. Is, uh, you know, I think all, all those in